Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the astrological forecast for the month of February of 2023. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Bear River. Hey, you guys, welcome. Hey. hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me today. All right, let me give a little overview of the astrology of February here at the beginning. Then we're going to transition to a talk about some news stories that have happened over the past month and the astrology associated with them before eventually jumping into the forecast for February. So I'll put timestamps um, below this video in the description for those that want to jump ahead, as well as on the podcast website entry for this episode. All right, so here's the planetary alignments calendar from our wall poster for 2023. So February starts off pretty early with a full moon in the sign of Leo on February 5th as our first lunation of the month. Then later in the week, Mercury ends its very long uh, trek through Capricorn because it's been retrograde in that sign for like a month now, and it finally ingresses or moves into the sign of Aquarius on February 11th. Then the following week, we get a Venus-Neptune conjunction in Pisces on the 15th, just the day after Valentine's Day, followed by a Sun-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius on the 16th of February. Then a couple days later, we get the Sun moving into Pisces on the 18th, Venus moves into Aries, departing from Pisces on the 20th, and the same day there is a new moon in the sign of Pisces on February 20th. So there's some other aspects and other minor things going on this month that we'll talk about, but that's basically the broad or general outlines of the things that we're going to be getting into in our forecast for this month. All right. So hey, welcome both of you. Bear, thanks for joining us. It's your first time doing a forecast with us. It, it is. Thank you so much for having me. You and I just recorded the Aquarius episode in the Zodiac series a few days ago with Aaron Fogel, mm -hmm. and that was a lot of fun to do. So I thought it would be great to have you on for this episode uh, since it's still Aquarius season. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it it feels feels like a, a fitting treat as an Aquarius moon person, and I think that was actually my like exact precise lunar return, uh, maybe like an arc minute off when we started recording. So just nice. keeping keeping the trend going. I love when stuff like that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, Austin, how have you been doing since we last saw you at our forecast, which we recorded in what, like mid-December? Yeah, well, so immediately following that, I went into a, a nine-day coma um, in right. order to restore myself. I, I, was, I, was, I was awake and walking around, but I, I remember nothing and was exhausted. Yeah, um, and then, I don't long, know. That was a long recording day. That was our longest podcast ever. Mm. But um, I don't know. I've been on kind of a, I don't know. A, a, I guess a sort of trite New Year grind. I've just been doing my exercises and doing my mantras and working, working on my book and teaching my classes. And I've been uh, been in a very orderly uh, fellow. Um, so nice. boring, but the useful kind of boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a little like a, a little delay to getting the year started because of those retrogrades that were just finishing up in January. Uh, first, the Mars retrograde finished, I think, like a week into January, and then Mercury the following week stationed direct finally. And I've, I've felt the shift as both of those have stationed direct, and it seems like we're moving forward into new territory finally after kind of a long winter season here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, 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 tried to take that into account for um, getting back to work and doing, you know, uh, New Year's things. I, uh, I set, I set some parameters and for like, oh, you're going to do this, you know, on these days, these days of the week for this many hours, but then um, made sure to leave it open to tweak on the, on the Mercury direct station. And I'm glad I did because what I initially set out was kind of unrealistic. And so I was like, now I, you know, uh, I've got two weeks in. Now I know that, and was able to tweak it into something that was, um, you know, workable. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the just the image of uh, if you've ever driven in the snow, getting stuck where you don't have traction and having to kind of like get one foot out the door and rock the car until you really do get enough friction. And thinking about the the slow, slow, slow chug out of the station of. Uh, of Mars, like still at eight degrees, still at eight degrees. But as soon as we get into February, like, I think we'll finally feel the momentum pick up. So that's funny that you mentioned that because during during the Mercury retrograde, 
Um, we had somebody deliver food to our house, right? Like a DoorDash person. Um, and they got stuck in the snow. And so I had to go out and literally push, help push them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, there was, there was some nice rocking. And I like that, that image with the, cause some, when it's, when you're not that stuck, you can just do a straight push out. But a lot of times you do have to kind of get a little back and forth going and then gun it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so we're coming out of that. Um, why don't we talk about and do some review at this point about the astrology of the past month and any news stories that have come up and just some of the things that we've seen manifest in world events over the course of the past few weeks since we did the last episode. Um, so were there any like major news stories or like personal experiences or like client stories that either of you had that come to mind in terms of stuff that you saw over the past month? I have a really simple personal one. Um, so I started a particular long-term workout plan la the end of last March. And it just so happens that I finally like finished the criteria of that. I completed that on the day of Mars direct station. And nice. that was not planned at all. It just so happened that that was the case. I was like, hold on, isn't this, isn't this the Mars station? And yeah. So that was kind of uh, that was kind of nice. It just shows you, you know, that uh, each planet is a is a clock for its sphere of activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I had my um my astrologer good experience of my my perfection playing out back when Mars stationed retrograde. Um, and got hit super hard in the elbow. Like, of course, it's Gemini, so it's down between the the fingers and the shoulders, and got a a contusion to my ulnar nerve. And so Ooh. the nerve itself is injured. Um, and with the station coming up, I was like, okay, it's either going to magically resolve itself or it's going to peak in intensity and get even worse, which it did, unfortunately. But that was also when I finally got the various claims and stuff in motion to get the first actual treatment for it. So seeing that kind of timing of like, yeah, oh, still no appointment, still no appointment. And then eyeing those retro or the station directs um, <clears throat> and seeing that finally get some some progress well it's good to hear that that's uh improving that's wild um i know somebody who also had uh an ulnar nerve issue that was aggravated and made them leave work um right after the mars station um and then you know speaking of the sphere of mars in mma there was the right around the mars retrograde station there was this rash of crazy shoulder injuries that ruined title fight after title fight and I just heard, and this is so Mars is direct now that the one, uh, 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 the, was it Yuri, uh, Prohatska, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, who was the 205 champion, um, went out during the Mars retrograde station. And it was reported that he had one of the worst shoulder injuries ever seen in that sport, which is saying something, right. Ooh, yeah. Um, and that he wouldn't be able to defend his title for over a year. But Mars just stationed direct, and now he's like, "Yeah, I can fight." So nice. that's really lucky. Yeah, I, and I, who knows? It was overestimated, or da da da. But the um, yeah, the the physical quality, the number of shoulder, wrist, forearm injuries that mm -hmm. I've seen with this Mars retrograde in Gemini is it's pretty wild. It really shows you the um, that almost silly looking zodiac guy you know with uh, the signs <laughs> right. pointing to the different body regions is yeah um that's that's science yeah because you always you look at that and you're like you're like oh that's quaint and you see yeah. you know illustrations of it like medieval manuscripts but yeah no my shoulder i messed up my shoulder literally on the mars station in october and november doing push-ups and uh yeah that's been that's been annoying um yeah. And last little thought about that with the Mars sphere, just Mars being related to inflammation and the shoulders and elbows and wrists and all of the tendons and nerves through there being particularly susceptible to being put out of commission by inflammation itself. Like even if the injury isn't that bad, the inflammation will pinch a nerve or impinge it and put you out. Yeah, mm. I mean, that's 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 what arthritis is, right? Right. That's tennis elbow. That's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Um, all right, so other news stories and stuff since we last checked in. Where do I start? So one of the things that happened, because this happened right after we recorded the last forecast, 
Um, but it was something that we'd actually talked about in the previous year ahead forecast for 2022, which was the release of Avatar in theaters when or Avatar 2 in theaters when Jupiter retrograded back into Pisces and did its last conjunction with Neptune in Pisces. And weirdly, um, because we had noticed that the first Avatar movie was re- released under a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Aquarius way back in 2009. And so it was weird that it just happened to be that 13 some odd years later, uh, James Cameron ended up finishing and releasing his follow-up movie, Avatar 2, on another Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, this time in Pisces. And the movie was centered around water and like being in the ocean. And there was a lot of innovative use of technology in order to depict um, like computer generated ocean scenes, essentially. So, weird story about that. But the day that the movie came out, and it was under that Jupiter Neptune conjunction with Mars widely squaring it. And Austin, you had used the metaphor of like a bubble popping for many months during that time. And a lot of that was also tied in with like inflation and the attempts to like get a, for the government to like get a, a control of inflation and things like that. Weirdly, like the day that Avatar was released, um, this happened where this aquarium at a hotel in Berlin that was holding 1,500 fish just like exploded and just burst that day and flooded like this entire hotel with um, fish with this like gigantic fish tank. And it was like this weird piece of like simultaneous like symbolism, like all sort of overlapping on the same day that I thought was kind of weird. Where sometimes, even though that stuff seemed kind of com- comical or like weird, stuff comes up in the news that sometimes plays out the astrology in these very bizarre ways, um, roughly sort of coinciding with the transits. Yeah, it is. It's, um, you know, uh, when you watch this kind of thing for long enough, especially against astrology, you see that like reality itself has metaphor as part of its language. Um, and that humans can do metaphors too, but that the, the metaphorical <laughs> like is a naturally uh, occurring phenomenon, mm-hmm. um, which I think when people start to notice that it does drive some of them mad if they don't have recourse to astrology, um, people get begin to believe that all of this is planned by human intelligence because they don't mm. think of the the mind of the world doing metaphor. It's got to be a human mind. Yeah. Mm. Well, and it's just that um, all of the, these transits and stuff are manifesting in a multitude of different ways in you know hundreds and thousands and, and sometimes millions of people's lives in different ways. Um, but occasionally, what we when we see something that pops up in the news stories that like fits that symbolism archetypally, it's really just showing you like the tip of the iceberg. Um, but that's one of the reasons why it's okay sometimes to note those one-off news stories because they're actually representative of a lot of other stories that you're not seeing that are happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it, yeah, it stands in for other events. Yeah, if we're looking at the kind of macro cos- microcosm macrocosm then if we had enough information we should in theory be able to look at any one moment and then tell the story of everything through just the metaphor of that moment that's right. like impossibly inaccessible 90% of the time like that's a jupiterian everything and like that's the part of pisces that gets out of control and hard to name and when you talk too much about neptune and your brain goes foggy um but in theory yeah that's there whether it's the the friction of not getting friction and seeing, oh, okay, that's expressed in <clears throat> in you know um, with Kevin McCarthy and everything that was going on with with Congress was just kind of laughing about that, like yeah, there's no friction to to be gained to move forward yet. Oh right, that was like during was that during the Mercury retrograde still? I think Mercury is still retrograde when that was all and like Congress was up in everything was up in the air and they they couldn't pick a Speaker of the House for like days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So that was happening. Um, I saw Avatar two. It was actually surprisingly like he was able to pull it off. Like I, I think everyone was like surprised about whether somebody could do a sequel thirteen years later that would be worth not just doing a sequel but also setting it up because apparently he's also wrote written like two or three other movies after this. One of which is already in post production. So it's like this is like a whole cinematic universe. But it, somehow he was able to pull it off, like making this interestingly enough interesting enough and like continuing the story enough to make it worthwhile 
but especially like with the first one, primarily in terms of the technology and just like taking the technology another leap forward, both in terms of the immersiveness of the 3D effect, which is really what this movie and the previous one was about, what was making a movie that feels immersive and gives you a sense of like presence of like being there, which is a very Jupiter Neptune thing. Um, but also I noticed afterwards we had had this whole discussion in the year ahead forecast about the upcoming Jupiter Uranus conjunction in Taurus this year and talking about different technological innovations uh, with that as well as people in the past who've had that conjunction and have really focused on pushing forward, pushing the limits of technology and growth and expansion through technology. And, and one of the examples I used was Steve Jobs. Um, who had a Jupiter Uranus conjunction, and he was the founder of Apple Computer, and you know helped promote the personal PC like revolution of everybody having a computer in their home, as well as eventually the mobile phone revolution with the iPhone. So interestingly, I realized afterwards that um, James Cameron, the filmmaker, the director of Avatar Two, also has a Jupiter Uranus conjunction. And I just think that's really fascinating, not just because of that movie, but because he's just been known for pushing the limits of technology and especially CGI in filmmaking for many years, going back to some of his early movies with like, you know, Terminator, Aliens 2, um, The Abyss, and stuff like that. But also his first like gigantic blockbuster, um, Titanic which was released in 1997 and some of the CGI and stuff they used in order to recreate the Titanic. And it turns out uh, Patrick Watson noticed this, that that movie was also released under a Jupiter Uranus conjunction in 1997. So the same time that Steve Jobs was releasing his think different ad campaign under that same Jupiter Uranus conjunction that was kind of like um, tied in with his natal signature, James Cameron with that same natal signature was also, you know, doing something big and innovative in terms of technology. But that was kind of kind of interesting, kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you saw the first Avatar, right, Austin? I did. It's a long time ago. Yeah, but you still. I think everyone has kind of like a vague memory of it being kind of immersive and and that three D experience being kind of unique at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a big deal. People were talking about it nonstop. I was actually living in LA then. So there were, uh, I had a lot of, I heard a lot of, how should I say, disreputable people talking about how they've, they've got a technology similar and it's going to change this and they're going to do a movie. You know, in LA, everybody's trying to pitch you something all the time, even if you have no power or influence. You, they, you could, they can at least uh, absorb your power of belief and try to use that for some purpose. Mm. But yeah, I, I remember it, 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 you know, it was quite the, a lot of conversation, a lot of unasked for uh, non-consensual pitch meetings, um, ended up <laughs> happening as a result of that. Yeah. Well, and there was so many that would, that started the like whole 3d trend for several years where a bunch of movies after that quickly ran to make like 3d versions of their own movies. Which is often like not not as good and like didn't work out terribly well. I saw one of the Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know which one it was that they did in 3D, um, and it gave me a terrible headache and wasn't enjoyable at all. I remember it ruined the movie. I don't think it was supposed to be 3D. They just kind of added that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Pirates Four. I watched the movie like I don't know eight years later, and I was like, oh, I actually kind of like this movie. Um, but I didn't at all in the three day it, it um ruined the experience. Mm, sure. Yeah. Well it's it's interesting. It's worth checking out just for the sake of like experiencing a transit. Like this is literally like a Jupiter Neptune transit, and it's like that's that's what that's like is yeah, weird immersiveness, which um yeah, transports you to like a different world in some sense. So um that was one of the news stories that happened recently. Um, other similar news stories is I feel like the um, Saturn-Neptune conjunction next year is coming in, coming in real fast, and I'm already starting mm -hmm. to see where that's headed. And like one of the key words it seems like that's going to happen for next year is um, the blurring of the boundary or the distinction between what's real and what's not. 
and also sometimes augmenting reality. And, and the technology of augmented reality seems like it's one of the main things that's coming up over the next year. Because we remember we were doing the forecast episodes back during the Saturn Neptune square back around like the 2016, 2017 mm -hmm. timeframe. And that summer was like the summer that the Pokemon Go uh, craze took off where people were using their mobile phones where you could like see little creatures like running around digitally around parks and stuff. And people were like chasing them. And there was like this interesting blurring between what was real and what wasn't. So um, Facebook just released a new headset that focuses on augmented reality. And supposedly Apple is getting ready to release their own VR headset that'll have both a virtual reality as well as an augmented reality component. And if that happens, then that's going to be a really interesting way to kick off the Saturn Neptune co-presence in the same sign that's going to last for like five or six years if one of the biggest tech companies in the world like really moves into the virtual reality space. That may be um, a sign of something that's going to become a much bigger trend than it is up to this point. Yeah, definitely. Uh Quick note, uh, Pokemon, uh, the first Pokemon game came out Saturn and Pisces. Um, so this will be the Saturn return. Um, oh, okay. And, you know, already having shown, um, already having shown, uh, you know, um, uh, an interest in doing augmented reality, right? Pokemon Go is really successful. It'd be surprising if we didn't get sort of the next iteration of that during the Saturn return. Mm, right. And that, that is a thing about both January as well as February, which we'll come to, is that this is the end. This is the, uh, the, these are the dregs, the results um, of Saturn in Aquarius. We are just about done. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of a retrospective quality. You know, the, it's almost an epilogue, I would say, at this point. You know, we, we've really had... We, you know, we've had these sort of big, dramatic, climactic, um, fixed, you know, fixed T square, fixed uh, opposition uh, configurations. But this is they're they're you know we're coming up on a conjunction of the Sun and Saturn in Aquarius this month, and it'll be the last for a long time. But you know, like this is this is the epilogue. This is the results. This is the uh, the raising of the Shire. <laughs> Maybe hopefully not. I'm just yeah. thinking in terms of epilogue. Well, for some people, it's more positive than that. It's been interesting seeing some of the Saturn and Aquarius people finishing up their Saturn returns and getting to that that final stage, like you're saying, like the epilogue stage, where they've kind of made it at this point and it's winding down. And some of the ones that were success stories where it went relatively well, like you're seeing the results of that at this point now that Saturn's getting ready to depart from Aquarius here in the next month or two. Um, one of the ones I had been paying attention to since like 2020 was um, Miley Cyrus because she has this just like amazingly placed Saturn in the 10th house of career. And back in 2020, I, I made a tweet just sort of trying to call it and just, just being like, Miley Cyrus is going to be a Saturn return success story just because when I looked at her chart, um, she, here I'll pull it up for those watching the video version of this. So she has late Taurus rising with Saturn at 13 degrees of Aquarius, conjunct the degree of the midheaven at 8 Aquarius, and it's in a day chart. It's in its own domicile. It's in the 10th house, and it also has this very nice trine from Jupiter, which is at 8 degrees of Libra, trining both the degree of the midheaven as well as Jupiter, and thus bonifying Saturn, uh, while Saturn is also in aversion to Mars, which is down there in Cancer. So anyway, she just released a new single titled Flowers last week, and it's debuted already on the Billboard like number one, and I think has has quickly become like her one of her most successful songs I think ever. Um, so she's like enjoying like wild success right now, and the the music video for it, which kind of went viral, just shows her like dancing sort of gleefully while um, also sort of expressing coming out of this long-term relationship that um, didn't go well for her, but that she's happy to be free of. And I thought that was such a great metaphor for like a Saturn return. Mm -hmm. Well, even like I was, even the, <clears throat> the fact that I guess in that music video she filmed 
at the location where her ex was persistently cheating on her. Mm. And so there's this kind of like, all right, yeah, this Saturn, this Saturnian shitty thing that happened, I'm going to make, I'm going to turn that to my advantage and then just put it right there in the 10th house for everyone to see. Um, right. Maybe there's something there too about the like, you know, notice her Venus in Capricorn and would have had the like, the, the double whammy Venus return because of those retrogrades on either side mm. of 2022. Yeah, for sure. And just like making something positive out of something that was difficult or like being able to showcase one's challenges or, or trauma or hardships, but then to overcome them and still come out on top in the end. That's a real like the positive version of like the Saturn return sort of type story or manifestation. Yeah. And it, it is, oh, Chris, a really good example of just a, a positive Saturn placement and then the return on that. Because when Saturn, uh, when you have Saturn's favor, you're um, confirmed, right? Your success is confirmed. You're established. Um, you know, it's like it, it, it sort of, you know, it confirms that she is an established um, fixture in the music industry. Uh, Saturn ensconces and thrones and shrines. You know, it puts you um, when you know it puts you in a fortified position. Right, like a position that's not easy to assail and that is um, not uh, not fragile or um, as temporary as most uh, as most most as most success is. That's actually a really good point. It's even more relevant for her, of course, because she was a child star, and so many child stars have that struggle sometimes of like having success earlier in life when they're super young, but then sometimes. You know that that situation that happens when sometimes people peak earlier, or, or like what happens in the scenario where you, you know you're, the height of your popularity is like earlier in life, and then you're never able to like recapture that. Or in some instances, there's like an extreme drop off where um, you know a person really like struggles in adulthood to like find what to do or what their what their purpose or focus should be or what have you. So her having a more positively placed Saturn both had that experience of success very early on, but she's now been able to like reinvent herself and continue to stay relevant in her chosen career field in a way that's, that's probably feels fulfilling. I assume. Yeah. yeah. It's better than most alternatives. It's interesting yeah. that you use the word reinvent. One of the things I just was kind of noticing as I was watching the video was that it, it was giving me Madonna the Vogue video vibes, like mm. the the structured shoulders, definitely. And it's like, okay, there's a little fashion trend coming around there, and I'm sure we could deconstruct that. But um, <clears throat> it just felt like this very clear statement of, yeah, like I have there's there is enough command of my identity that I can claim it and reshape it and mold it and then like present to you this new edifice of my identity. Um, and that reinvention just felt like. Um, that it was hearkening back to 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 the archetype of the person who can reinvent themselves. I think that's what felt super Madonna like to me in watching that. Yeah, for sure. That's a really good point. Um, have either of you noticed either any other Saturn return stories lately um, that have come up with the Saturn and Aquarius people, or does that make you think of any sort of anecdotes from your own Saturn returns? Did you two have good Saturn returns or bad Saturn returns? I had a great Saturn return. Yeah. What was like the start? What was the setup versus like what was the finish? Uh, the setup was uh, as Saturn entered the sign, I endoed on my bicycle, broke two teeth, and ended up <sighs> not moving far away. And as a result, uh, I've, Saturn rules my seventh house and is in my sixth house. As a result, I ended up taking a random job that really sucked. Um, and I immediately realized I wanted to leave it, but I ended up meeting my my partner there. Um, mm. And so met somebody through unfortunate circumstances, hated the job, really liked the person, ended up getting married, traveled abroad for the first time. So by the end of that Saturn return, it's like, oh, all these other qualities of Saturn is L7 in the sixth, ruling my lots, doing other things, configured to everything. Yeah, that's great. That's classic, classic Saturn return. Yeah, mine. I I also have Saturn ruling my seventh, and so Kate and I got together. Well, so we got together just before my Saturn return, but we moved in together. Um, I think 
within a week of Saturn's ingress into Virgo. Um, and then I, I, um, I, I think I tried to get the jump on my Saturn return because I think six months earlier, I'd made a solemn vow to myself that I was going to be a full-time astrologer. I was going to make a living doing that. And I wasn't going to take any other job. I was just going to make this work, you know, burn the boats. Um, and that was really hard, um, <laughs> for the, uh, for the time that Saturn was in Virgo. Um, it was depressing. I was super broke. Um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, financial anxiety and shame. Um, but by the end of it, I was doing it. So, you know, I got, um, a future wife and a career out of it. So not too bad. Nice. That's pretty good. Um, what about well, you, Chris? I mean, I had a lot of stuff. I don't want to go into it, but it was a, it was a, it was a Saturn return. I, you know, I have Aquarius rising and Saturn's up in my 10th. So it was a lot of things tied in there at once. Um, but one thing I am excited now, since it's getting towards the end of Saturn and Aquarius, one thing we traditionally do on the astrology podcast is we do a Saturn return retrospective. So I may put out an open call soon for people if they want to share their Saturn return stories if they're finishing up a Saturn return in Aquarius, whether it's their first or second or potentially even third, uh, just to sort of um, do some field research to see how that went for everybody and to, to understand the full range of different experiences now that we're coming to the end of that transit and we can kind of learn something about it from, from hearing different people's stories. Mm -hmm. So one, one set of Saturn returns that's almost self-explanatory is a lot of the um, former Soviet bloc nations are having their Saturn return, and um, the European Union, the chart that I favor, is also a Saturn in Aquarius. And I would say that um, Europe, both east, west, north, and south, um, has gone through a lot recently, and things, will, things are definitely different moving forward. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, as well as we've talked a lot over the past few years about the Saturn return of the World Wide Web and the internet and some of the different things that have happened with that over the past few years and the sort of turning point that it's reached. This so, is go ahead. maybe an odd Saturn return, but um, I was after our Aquarius episode, I was looking into um, the My Stroke of Insight TED Talk that uh, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor presented back in 2008. Um, and was realizing that Saturn and Uranus, Saturn and Neptune were were conjunct when Neptune was discovered uh, at 25 degrees of Aquarius. So we're about to have like a Saturn return of Saturn's position when Neptune was discovered. It's kind of like a weird mm. thing, but it does feel like there are some Neptunian themes around that, like augmented reality, blurring of reality, like um, Austin, like that that power of belief. I think that Jupiter Neptune conjunction kind of highlighting it, but also almost a uh, a self-conscious awareness of the ways in which technologies that change the that like redefine the limits of what's possible redefine the limits of what we can imagine the way that titanic and the submarine that was used to film that movie did the way that <clears throat> multiple movies that james cameron has released have done that um mm -hmm. and so it feels like in this in this time in this year the way in which at least as astrologers, but I feel like in, even in the cultural zeitgeist is is has its finger with a little bit more self awareness into the blurring of things to the like uh, alternative facts and all of that. That um, people are more aware of that propagandizing quality of narrative uh, of belief. Um, there's more structure and solidity to that. For sure. Yeah. 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 No, that's interesting. It, 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 when, as you were talking, I was just thinking about oh, these Saturn Aquarius years. And I mean, really just the, the Saturn in Capricorn and Aquarius, just the like extremely strong Saturn where the things that are heavy and solid um, and onerous are very clear in a lot of ways. People's explanations and ideas about them diverge wildly, but there's this, um, there's this sort of, there's been this sort of core of hardship uh or a core made of many hardships that was actually pretty solid and i'm wondering you know as saturn goes into pisces and joins neptune um if even that sort of disperses not like the center cannot hold but is but it, like even moving into a phase where there's not even a clear thing to argue over 
Mm. That makes sense. You know, like there's, there's, when you were talking about, especially when you mentioned the submarine, I just imagine, you know, being under the water. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that Saturn, when it's strong, does is it orients you by gravity, right? Like, a, you know, a scary thing, a dangerous thing, an onerous thing, um, uh, center your consciousness, right? Like, oh, I have to do this or else, or, um, I have to do this, but I don't want to do this, right? It's 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 very clear cut in its own way because it has a center of gravity. But I was just thinking about that um, being in 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 the ocean or any other large body of water where gravity still exists, but its influence is far less. Um, and you can get confused. People get confused when they're deep down um, between up and down, which you know is one thing that kills deep sea divers. Um, I don't know that that feels that kind of feels like where we'll be in not very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something there made me think about Ender's Game, but also this. I was talking with my partner earlier this morning about like, okay, I'm trying to find a bunch of news, and isn't it strange that back when we didn't have the internet and 24 hour news cycles, it was a little bit easier to access uh, a broad collection of many news events over a certain period of time, but that with because there's so much there's like a deluge of data that you drown in it and it's kind of hard to constantly be digesting or swimming in every single life and death consequential harsh reality all day every day eventually even if that's true even if it's important to know about like you still have to like go do some grocery shopping and like make dinner you can't just like try to solve all of the problems all of the time there's other stuff that has to get done yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny that you say that because I, I had that exact same experience over the last couple of weeks. And I literally found myself being like, well, you know, you know what they're, you know, a real hole in the market. If somebody could just tell me about events that have happened, um, cause every time I would go to try to learn about a thing that had happened, um, it was like two minutes of reporting and then 15 minutes of fucking opinions, um, mm -hmm. and like trying to match it to various narratives. And I was like, I don't care about you know, your, you know, mid-level fucking interpretation. Like, just tell me what you could have told me about eight stories in the time that you gave me uh, a bunch of um, repeated opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, there's still Reuters is useful, but Reuters doesn't do a good job of ranking the consequential and the inconsequential. The, the Economist actually used to be really good for that. That used to be my go-to. Mm -hmm. The, I feel like they've just been sliding and are much more editorial than they were like five years ago. If you find mm. something, let me know. Yeah, I, I, I will. I've been trying to, to find those sources of information, but also having this like, well, it tracks and it makes sense given Neptune being in Pisces that we would have this casting of the net so broad and so wide that um, there's that, I don't know who the quote belongs to or who to attribute it to rather, but that quote that like, um, lamenting that in this day and age somebody's opinion is viewed just as just as weightily as another person's facts or another person's collection of of real evidence um and so we end up in this weird echo chambery bubble yeah so i i, I want to jump in on that image of the net right so when you're if we talk about casting a very broad net if we look at where that's actually done which is industrial fishing mm -hmm. um you like they'll get you know when the when these boats cast the gigantic drag nets um sure they'll get you know they'll get some of the actual creatures they're looking for but you get tons of other shit you know you have dolphins and whales and all sorts of species and it's you know it's very it's wasteful and confusing mm -hmm. mm. i feel like that's that's definitely a neptune and pisces thing right like i was like okay I'm, i would like to um you know i wasn't really paying attention to the news last week what happened Right. And there were, there were some of the actual stories, but I got, you know, I believe, uh, dolphins were, were killed in the making of many of those YouTube videos <laughs> that I encountered. Yes. I felt like a dolphin being killed watching some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we're going to look back on this period. I've been realizing reflecting more and more over the past few months, this period of like Neptune and Pisces and just how it's been just like the wild west in terms of this early stage of the internet especially with like youtube channels and podcasts and everything else um that's allowed on the one hand the complete like almost, largely unrestricted nature of it has la allowed a lot of cool things to flourish including astrology and 
some of the other metaphysical or occult things lately that have exploded over the past decade, but it's also allowed for the flourishing of a lot of not great things. And I think when when Neptune goes into when it leaves Pisces and it goes into Aries, I think we're going to look back on this period and realize that there were some really positive ways that that sort of Wild West thing um, allowed some great things to flourish, but then also looking back on it um, and and realizing what we lost a little bit in that as well. So I guess we're talking, that's like what, two, three years from now, Neptune and in, in, in Aries? Yeah. 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 I don't know. Maybe, it, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's not... It's almost more like since uh, Neptune entered Pisces, it's almost more like that mid phase when um, when uh, corporate interests started moving into the partially organized, like there was enough known about the West that was like, oh, there's a lot of money. Um, and then you had like the Pinkertons come in and a lot of the like the sort of uh, very much, um, how should we say the. Uh, I don't grassroots isn't the right term, but like the people there just doing things without a central authority. Um, but you had like big interests kind of moving in, tentacling in, but it wasn't the phase where it's just America now. It's sort of that like that weird middle phase where you have larger, more mm, organizing uh, powers, but then you also have sort of, you know, because the, you know what I mean? You also have that sort of wild whatever that was left over from the first decade. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which yeah. It makes it more confusing than if it's, you know, than the first phase or the phase that followed. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I noticed in the, some, the last two episodes I did, we talked a, a little bit about um, skeptics and, of astrology and um, that whole community. And it's been interesting that for whatever reason over the past decade during this time where there's been this simultaneous like rise in the popularity of astrology there was also a unrelated decline in like the skeptic community where the skeptic community is much more um all over the place and like not organized and and had a whole loss of leadership over the past decade and i feel like a lot of that's somehow connected to this neptune and pisces transit I remember Austin, you talked about the last time Neptune was in Pisces coincided with that uh, period of interest in like spiritualism and stuff like that in the 1800s. Yeah, the first year we got the uh, the famous Seance Sisters, um, mm. and then it, it you know doing seances, talking to dead people became a cool, respectable thing to do on a Saturday night. Yeah, I mean that is still your Saturday nights. I think last time I heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that's probably the most appropriate night. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. Um, it's interesting thinking back to the the last Jupiter Neptune conjunction in Pisces, which I, I talked about at Esar, and looking at that like that period of of westward expansion. You know, that is when the Lewis and Clark expedition happened, and one of the things I've been I talked about at that lecture, and I've been thinking about even today is like whose whose perspective grounds the story changes very dramatically, almost entirely. What's going on? Um, to the extent that it could even be like, you know, one reporter talking about two different worlds, Lewis and Clark expedition in particular, like, well, if you recenter and you tell that story from the perspective of the indigenous folks who are experiencing um, the contact that never stops, if it if not the first contact, um, then it becomes a very, very different story, even though it's still about waterways and expansion and redrawing borders and and whatnot. It right. almost it's it's almost you almost get more the like the tsunami quality of oceanic Pisces, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You know, and one of the things that's really interesting to me that I've seen in my own life um, and read about is that when people dream of floods, um, it uh, and it's uh, and it and it corresponds to events in the world. It often means like a big restructuring of society, a massive ch massive and destructive change. Um, coming that usually isn't a flood, um, but like they like like for example, uh, Jung, uh, the famous Swiss psychologist, um, dreamed of a giant flood um, sweeping over Europe right before World War One, and I had um, <clears throat> I had all of these weird flood omens right before COVID started, and I didn't understand. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I just I understood that I was like, okay, that's like the third out of nowhere flood thing directed like right towards me. Um, but you know, 
anyway, I'm just thinking about that. Like, it's, you know, like the, the westward expansion as a devastating flood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of tsunamis that track and other mass disasters. And even just in, in terms of the astrology of the last couple of weeks, uh, I've been here in California where it felt like a bad storm relative to my memory of living in, up in Washington as a kid. Like, it flood from the sky, essentially. And there has been massive flooding and huge uh, surge storm surge that went up up river down in Santa Cruz and people being evacuated and stuff in ways that isn't normal and doesn't really have a, a previous a prior context or precedent hmm. yeah 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 um so going back to some of the technology talk and the Saturn and Aquarius stuff to return to back to follow up on something I talked about that I just like started to discover and was just, had just started happening when we recorded the year ahead forecast in early to mid December was the whole um, AI thing, artificial intelligence thing has just been blowing up like crazy, um, especially through this company OpenAI and their product chat GPT, which is just like coming up in news stories over and over again at this point. I um, kept messing with, I kept playing with it basically after we did the forecast episode and like trying to get it to do different things to see what it could do and like what, and I kept giving it progressively what I thought were like harder and harder things to do, but it kept impressing me. So at first, and I think I may have shown this on the year ahead forecast, I, I told it to delineate, you know, Venus conjunct Mercury in a birth chart, and it gave a pretty nice little delineation. So a few days later, after the year ahead forecast, I was like, okay, um, you know, do a delineation of Mercury conjunct Venus, but put it in the form of a poem. And I was like, that's not going to do that very well. And then I asked it to do it and it did it and it spit this poem out that is actually pretty good. So I posted this on Instagram just with the image that it made it look like I had written it at first. And it says, Mercury and Venus conjunct in the chart, bring together communication and the heart, a harmonious blend of words and feeling, diplomacy and understanding, a rare and special healing, a love of beauty, aesthetics and art, an eye for detail, a creative heart luxury and indulgence, the finer things in life. With this placement, so much joy and beauty rife. So <laughs> I posted that and I was like, and that was written by an artificial intelligence, like welcome to the future. And half of Instagram was really impressed and the other half was very horrified basically, which I think is gonna be like a recurring reaction over the next several years as we continue to see this technology expand more and more. So I gave it that, challenge. I thought that was really um, pretty impressive. So then I was just like, what's something absurd to take it to the next level? And so I said, I said, okay, delineate Mercury conjunct Venus, um, but put it in the form of a rap song by the rapper Eminem. And about five, it thought about it. And for like five, 10 seconds later, it produced this, this rap song. It says verse one, Yo, what's up, y'all? It's your boy Eminem. I'm here to drop some knowledge on the astrological scene. Got a question about Mercury conjunct Venus in the birth chart? Well, let me break it down and give you a fresh start. And it starts the chorus. Mercury conjunct Venus, ain't that some shit? It's a cosmic alignment, yo. You can't miss it. Um, and it just keeps going on. It gives like two verses and a chorus. It's a cosmic alignment. You can't miss it. It's all about communication and love. Ain't that a combo you're thinking of? So what does it mean when these two planets align? Well, it's all about the way you communicate and shine. You're a natural at expressing yourself and your love life is sure to be off the shelf. Uh, and then it repeats the chorus and later the bridge is, but it's not all sunshine and roses. There can be challenges and challenges. It's important to find balance and harmony and not let the ego get in the way of unity. And it continues the chorus and it just keeps going on. So I laughed, my initial reaction was I laughed hysterically when I saw that because I did not expect it to actually produce that. But this AI having taken in like and searched like a huge part of the internet in 2021 when it was trained, of course has access to just like all of the lyrics of all of Eminem's songs. So it just like tried to match and use that to inform while combining it with the delineation of Mercury conjunct Venus. And I just thought that was that was wild. Like we're in like some weird futuristic stages if stuff like that's true, especially if this is just the beginning. If this is like the initial phase of this, you know, where is this going to be in five or 10 or 20 years, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think Chat GPT is a very dope MC. Um, I think <laughs> Chuck D can rest easily and safely. Uh, I think it'll be a while. Um, but one of the things that's interesting is it does um, a lot of this uh, AI uh, AI output um, really shines a light on how formulaic a lot of human expression is right there are rules governing their syntaxes and rules governing a lot of this stuff that is you know quote unquote artistic um and, and but, astrology in particular like that's i think that's why it's actually doing so well with astrology it's because astrology is a language and this ai is specifically designed for language models and that's why it's actually able to do things relatively effectively yeah, hundred percent, right? And so, in some ways, it, I think it it'll do a nice job of framing what the what the human is uniquely capable of, right? Because a machine can replicate patterns that it has um, had input into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's good. It's um, it, or I think in in some ways, you know, it you know, because people, if we're talking about works of art, right? Um, to be trite and derivative is to be is for something to be a not good work of art, which means that you're just repeating a formula that was previously established, right? And so it seems like there will increasingly be less room for trite and derivative human artists or would be artists, which is okay because they weren't creating the good stuff. They were literally just chat GPTing better works anyway. Uh, it also reminds me of. Um, if either of you read uh, the novel We by uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin, no, it's the um, it's the lesser known sort of um, how should we say sibling of 1984 and Brave New World. Um, it was dystopian fiction from the first half of the 20th century. Uh, I remember, I don't know, 20 years ago, like I read uh, Brave New World and. Um, uh, uh, in 1984, and I don't know, I was reading something. I was like, "Oh, you know, really, you got to read We." And what's interesting is We, which is a more Eastern European sort of take on it. Um, in that in that uh, dystopia, all of the music is basically produced by AI. That has he doesn't use the term AI, but it's it's the same thing that like scooped up and sorted through all of the you know all of the the great works of, of music. And then just creates music that has the structure to to evoke the you know whatever specific emotional effect it's supposed to have, right? Because you could easily you know teach a do you think that okay so minor key blah 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 this will make people feel melancholy this will make major keys I, I don't know much music theory but you know this will make people feel good um, but it feels very and I believe there's literature that's also done that way in we it's been a long time. Um, but it's very like that. That's the dystopia that got this piece. Mm. It's a short read. It's a short, good read. If you know, uh, if you want to complete the, the the classical dystopia trilogy, um, we by Yevgeny Zamyatin. All right. Yeah, we'll check it out. Um, anyway, so that was wild. Um, it was in the news. Interestingly, at the beginning of the Mars retrograde in Gemini, there were all these. Um, different instances in the news of like accusations of cheating in chess or in poker and other stuff like that like last fall and the more recent one as mars was stationing direct was stories about students starting to use uh, this ai in order to cheat and write like exams or write papers for them basically and, and teachers starting to panic over you know how do we tell if a student has actually written their term paper versus if they just like asked an, an AI to write it in like five seconds. So it was an interesting continuation of that with Mars in Gemini and that whole retrograde. But I feel like this this whole AI thing, it's like it's not going anywhere. Like this is basically the future. So I feel like astrologers have to learn how to adapt to and work with and deal with this. Cause I think even if we don't like it, it's not just going to go away because we don't like it. So um that's going to be part of you know the future in in especially in terms of the astrological community. Yeah, 100%. A few more things about that Mars now that you mention it. Mm -hmm. um, one big deal in January. So if Gemini, if Mercury and Gemini is, is the, the, na the natural place for games, right? Um, you know, Mercury is playful, likes competitive games, you know, competitive, collaborative, you know, whatever. Um, 
there was a huge hullabaloo uh, around Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, part of the reason it's so successful is that they've had an uh, basically an open license, uh, the open gaming license, the OGL, which allows any other company to make adventures and, and content for the game um, for free. Right. So you can, you know, um, you like we could write a D and D adventure using the, that rule set and publish it and not have to pay D and D anything. Um, and that's been ensconced for decades. And it's, you know, part of the reason there's so much D and D content. Um, so Hasbro now owns wizards of the coast, which owns dungeons and dragons. And, you know, Hasbro is, um, you know, a, a very typical giant corporation and, they try to revoke the open license so that anybody doing anything with the D&D rules would have to pay them. Um, and there was an unprecedented and massive revolt against this. Um, the, you know, uh, like the entire um, tabletop Internet came together um, and uh, Hasbro was forced to retract the retraction. Right. And so this is <laughs> beginning of the month, the uh, retro, you know, retrograde Mars ruled by the retrograde Mercury. And they're like, oh, we're, um, you know, we've, we've heard the players and uh, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to do this. We'll come back with something else. So there was that. Um, there was also, um, again, Mars and Gemini were looking for twinned uh, or doubled um, uh, forms. And so on the season, on season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race, which premiered during this time um for the first time ever there are a pair of contestants who are also who are twins who are identical twins who perform together sugar and spice um and spoiler alert right that's enough time to turn it off if you're just catching up um uh, uh early on in the season they were the bottom two and were forced to uh compete against each other and one got sent home and so this was filmed during the Mars retrograde, Mars, you know, Mars and Gemini, Mars retrograde, and premiered right around uh, Mars Direct. And so, um, you know, the night, uh, the rest of the season, we will, or for as long as they last, we will see um, one twin caught off, cu cut off from the other, which is, you know, that's like Mars trouble in Twin Town. Uh, I'm very excited to see if they uh, rise to the occasion. Uh, and understand themselves as an individual better, or if they just bleed from their second half or their other half being torn away. Um, also with Mars in Gemini, going direct, looking at the sphere of Mars, looking at uh, the ongoing Russo-Ukraine war. Um, I, I talked last month on the yearly about Mars stationing direct on Aldebaran and how Aldebaran is about big, heavy, substantial things talking about big trains uh, slowly leaving the station, like the movement of lots of material. And what that's ended up being are unprecedented shipments of heavy equipment um, uh, from NATO allies to Ukraine. Um, we have like dozen, we have, um, we have Bradleys and Strikers, and I believe there's some European main battle tanks, but it's just a ton of heavy equipment that's like literally on loaded onto heavy trains moving into uh the ukraine theater and then i suppose uh if we're talking about big heavy slow things um russia um russia's conscription or mobilization uh which happened around uh right as the mars retrograde was starting or getting ready to start has sort of like reached the front line so you have the like massive heaviness um on that side as well beginning to move forward you have russia right now slowly encircling bakhmut and so that like big heavy like that big heavy substantial starting to move forward quality is present on both sides um with now that morris is direct and conjunct al dabaron but that was just very literal yeah that's a, that's amazing um and lisa shine pointed out to me last night that um um, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, he when, when you know when you're in it or when uh, Jupiter went back into Aries in December, not that long ago, that was Jupiter going back into Zelensky's eleventh house, and he um, came to the U.S. and he gave a speech in front of Congress, and now of course, um, you know, into the eleventh house of friends, and now of course. 
um, a lot of different countries in Europe as well as the U.S. are like re doubling their efforts to send um, aid and send military assistance and things like that recently over the past several weeks. Um, so that's kind of interesting, just like an 11th house transit, positive transit from through the house of friends and literally having allies sort of um, supporting you essentially. So we'll see how that goes in the future. All right, very last news story that I had before we get on the forecast. Um, there's this funny... Uh, social media exchange that happened a couple of weeks ago where the actor Andrew Garfield was like on the red carpet and he was did this like really quick interview with a journalist named Amelia Dimoldenberg and they were kind of like flirting but there was some astrological lingo dropped in, during the course of their little brief exchange that went viral and I thought it was really striking if you watch the exchange I don't think I can play it here for copyright reasons, but just to sort of summarize to summarize it, um, he ended up asking her her sun sign, and she replied Aquarius. But then he gave like a reaction to it. He was like, he was like, oh, Aquarius, sort of like a facial reaction. And she says, that's your moon sign, almost like with a question mark. And then he looks at her surprised, and he he starts to say, how did you know that? Basically. Um, and then he looks at her knowingly because he realized that it meant that she had looked up his birth chart because you only know somebody's like moon sign if you've like looked up their actual chart. So it was like a funny little astrology flirting exchange by a couple of nerdy Aquariuses uh, or an Aquarius sun and an Aquarius moon. And he mentioned astrology and then people have posted other links where he's talked about like Saturn returns and like sun moon sinistry and other stuff like that. So one of the like subtle news stories of that is that like Andrew Garfield seems to either know quite a bit about astrology or actually maybe be like a part-time like amateur astrologer himself it seems almost if we can say that if his like knowledge of astrology sort of raises to that level which it almost seems to which is kind of interesting since he's a pretty well-known actor for his work in like the social network you know a decade ago or he was one of the actors that played Spider-Man um, before the the current one, who's been Spider Man for the past few movies, so funny little exchange. Have either of you done any like astrological flirting like that, where your your astrological skills have suddenly become very useful for like having that sort of exchange with somebody? Or I know Austin, are you both in relationships with astrologers or people that are astrology friendly? Uh, yes, I am. Um, my partner knows what the symbol for Chiron looks like, uh, but that. And I'm very proud of them for achieving nice. that. Yeah. Nice. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's a good start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and there's pros and cons. We've talked about it on the podcast before of uh, astrologers either, you know, dating or, or having relationships with other astrologers versus like not. And there, there's definitely pros and cons sort of like either way. But mm -hmm. this is like a very funny and interesting high profile sort of uh, exchange with astrology. And I think it's just shown also just like how far astrology has come lately in the public consciousness where it used to be just everybody knew their sun sign but that was it but now people are like you know exchanging moon signs and rising signs and all sorts of stuff and it's kind of interesting just seeing the level that it's gotten to mm -hmm. yeah it's um you know it, it reminds me of the 60s right where astrology came back into intersection with the um, well, I guess the counterculture, which would become the mainstream shortly. Um, and, you know, w with Neptune and Pisces, we, you know, we expected this to some degree, not to this degree. Um, and, but there's just sort of like, like we may be at the end of the crest of the wave, but there's a certain level of saturation, which will just be here for a while. Like people just know about it in the way they haven't for decades. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think about what you said about, um, you know, the rise of spiritualism when Neptune was in Pisces back in the 1800s. Like, and then at some point, most people were like, oh, yeah, seance. I've heard about that. Let's organize a seance for a dinner party. Just like people are like, yeah, let's have astrology themed everything tote bags, blankets, shawls, journals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, and that reminds me of um, a few days ago, Jen Zart was who recently shout out to Jen Zar, just got elected for the ESAR board um, and is now a board member on the International Society for Astrological Research. But she was doing this um, 
she was doing like a literature review because she wanted to know more about the institutional history of ISAR. So she started going back and reading their old journals um, at her astrological library that she's been building in Oregon, the Cayley Institute, which I'm actually giving a talk for next month, which I'll plug at the end of this episode. But she found this funny old um, 2004 article in the ESAR journal by Moses Siragar titled The Future of Astrology, where he's talking about the Association for Young Astrologers, which was recently founded at that point. And he has this interesting little um, anonymous tidbit from some 19-year-old punk uh, who he doesn't name at the time, but it sounds very familiar. But listen to this paragraph. It says, quote, I just found out about this group today, the Association for Young Astrologers. I'm 19 and I've been studying astrology intensely for about three years now, and I'm getting pretty good at it. I was accepted to Kepler College in December, and I just finished my first term, Astrology and Medieval Civilizations. I really love it there, and I would definitely recommend it. It's exciting for me to find a group like this because it's been really depressing coming to the realization that there aren't many young astrologers my age out there. So I don't know why that, why that was anonymous, but it sounds like me. I think I was the only like 19-year-old at Kepler College <laughs> in 2004, like fresh out of high school. But it also just sh has shown me how far things have come where you know I was 19 in the mid-2000s and just like lamenting there weren't any other younger astrologers my age. And then over the past few years, there's just been this sudden like influx of this whole other generation of people. And it's really heartening to see that and to see astrology continuing to thrive and flourish and be passed on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I think that's I good do, for this review. Uh oh, do you have, I have else? Yeah. Just like, I guess one smallish comment. Um, what you said about AI made me think about this idea that well, both of your comments about AI, that you know, there are no original ideas and chat GPT is basically just like remixing a bunch of old tropes and cliches that people fed to it. Um, but that it is really creating, I know with like the lens of AI, there's been a lot of artists who are um, up in arms about it. And it's really making <clears throat> the conversation around copyright reemerge. And so I just did a, a quick little look and the first big, maybe not first big copyright case, but a really big copyright case that was relevant to hip hop specifically, thinking about the way that jazz and hip hop are very American and uniquely American art forms that are derivative. That's part of what that is musically. Jazz takes common themes or common melodic um, sections from music and and riffs on it. That's what like big band music is, and hip hop is very similar. Like kind of takes mm -hmm. that jazz approach. Um, mm -hmm. And that first big case with Grand Upright Music Limited uh, versus Warner Brothers um, was December seventeenth, nineteen ninety one, and Saturn was like four degrees Aquarius. And so I'm wondering if the combination of AI and we're, you know we're on the verge of like the neural the, the neural net link or uplink or the matrix we're very close to being jacked into the matrix our literal brains and if people are able to hop online with an implant in their head and all it takes is thinking thoughts that then get fed into AI's data collection then that's going to like blur the line between what is a thought and what is the collection of AI harvesting thoughts. I don't know, just like copyright, the augmented reality, what's an original idea, what's not an original idea, what does it even mean to be a person having a thought? It seems like all of that may be coming up as Pluto gets closer to that degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's always a tension in art and creativity between um, creating something that's new and unique versus sometimes the creative repackaging or taking influence from earlier things. Like mm -hmm. you know, Star Wars, for example, you know, re repackaged a lot of stuff from um, like serials from George Lucas's youth, um, just in a new package. But it was wildly popular. Or even like you know, Avatar two, he really like follows a sort of like the playbook of like how you do a sequel and hits like all the normal beats of if you've seen any of James Cameron's like sequel movies of like do the same thing from the first movie. But then add like a little bit to it or add a twist to it. And that's basically what he did just past the $2 billion mark. So it's even if something's like derivative or inspired by earlier things, that doesn't always automatically mean it's not actually well received by the public or doesn't become influential itself. But yeah, there's always this like tension between the past and the future or like creativity versus like being influenced by the past when it comes to art. And, and that'll be really interesting. 
dialogue that obviously has become really intense lately. Mm. Yeah. All right. I think that's good for review. Um, I want to get into the forecast for next month. Um, I did need to mention, though, first our sponsor for this month, which is our friends over at Archetypal Explorer, uh, which is an online astrology program that you can use in order to track your transits as well as track the astrology that's happening in the world in general. So Archetypal Explorer uh, was built for astrology enthusiasts, and it provides astrological tools such as a horoscope chart, visual transit timeline, calendar, and it provides reference guides with interpretations. So if you've seen any of the like transit graphs that we've used on the podcast here over the past few years that takes a transit and plots it on a graph that shows the peak of the graph when the two planets are getting close to the exact aspect and then the graph declining as it's moving away from the exact aspect, all of that's from Archetypal Explorer. So it's got some really useful stuff, including some delineations from a book by Richard Tarnas that I don't think he's published yet that provides actual very detailed delineations of each of these transits so that you can kind of understand them and maybe get a different perspective from some of the more classic books like you know, Rob Hand's Planets in Transit, which is one of the only other transit books that's been out there forever. Um, so it's great for planning things and you can get, it's a membership based program with a, a free seven day trial if you want to try it out. So visit archetypalexplorer.com in order to learn more. Um, and I think you you've both used the program before, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, and we've, um, you know, we benefited immensely from having those visualizations, uh, in a number of podcasts, but especially when we were. We're tracking some of the more ominous, intense ones over the last couple of years, like Saturn Uranus and Saturn Pluto and the Mars Saturn. And um, it's really been uh, it's been an invaluable visualization tool. Yeah, you were just talking about the Saturn. You just did a Saturn election uh, the other day and you were talking about needing to get distance from the Saturn Uranus square first before you would do that election. And it just reminded me of that graph that we've been using from Archetypal Explorer for like two or three years now that just showed those waves of Saturn Uranus that we've been going through. Yeah, I waited, uh, I waited, <laughs> uh, Sphere and Sundry, Kate and I waited until, uh, the very end of the right side when the, uh, uh, when, when the arc went in back into the dirt and Uranus was no longer, um, storing the capital of Saturn, uh, every day before doing some magic. Mm -hmm. That's smart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you, you've used it as well, Bear? Yeah, it's great. I'm like looking to see if I have my, um, I really like it because I have actually done things like draw a whole little poster trying to plot out the relationship between different synodic cycles and like right. with my ESAR talk about the, the Jupiter Neptune conjunctions and even some of the, you would have had to have been like an eye astrologer to hear me talk about these sort of things, but I've been looking at, um, astrological generations but through the lens of synodic cycles, not planetary ingresses. I think those are secondary and only give us detail and that it's synodic cycles that define generations and archetypal explorer is great for seeing stuff like that and playing around with that data. Nice. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, uh, people can check that out at archetypalexplorer.com. Uh, so shout out to them. And uh, oh yeah, last thing, this is no longer topically relevant, but uh, I decided to make a Christmas tree this year, but I decided to make it astrologer nerdy and uh wow. put some i found some planetary what? ornaments like a little saturn ornament and a little jupiter a little uranus ornament just to make things a little little festive uh so i just want to want to share that really quickly i was pretty proud of that first time doing a christmas tree in 20 years yes um fringe benefits of astrology's heyday exactly you gotta make make use of it while you can all right Let's talk about the astrology of February. Um, I'm going to put up the chart of the moment, and I'm going to put up the. I'm going I'm to animate the chart using Solar Fire, and I'm going to move it forward to February first. All right. So this is the opening of the month on February first. We begin the month, of course, since it's February, with the Sun in Aquarius, Saturn in late Aquarius, Mercury is 
midway through Capricorn, but at this point it's moving fast. It's moving faster than its average daily motion by the time we open February. So it's going to cruise right on out of Capricorn here um, after the first part of the month. Venus opens in the sign of Pisces and spends most of the month moving through the sign of Pisces, where it will eventually catch up to and conjoin Neptune. Jupiter now is firmly in Aries and is sailing fully away from that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction that we were experiencing in December. Mars, though, is the one planet that's still moving extremely slowly, still coming off of its station. It's taking forever to like gain steam. It is up to 10 degrees Gemini by the first of the month. Um, but that's still only like two degrees off of where it's stationed at eight degrees of Gemini. So my condolences to anybody that had anything at eight to ten degrees of the mutable signs that's been dealing with that. But that irritant transit will be gone soon. And then finally, the last thing is Uranus recently stationed in Taurus, and it's still moving slowly. It still opens the month at fourteen degrees of Taurus, where it's been sitting for quite a while and having an intensification of that transit but it will quickly move into 15 degrees and will start picking up steam and finally moving out of those mid degrees of the fixed signs finally as it starts moving into later degrees in the third decan of taurus this year so that's that is how the month opens uh what should we start with what should we discuss first what stands out about the first week of february to either of you well, I would say the first thing is just that uh, although Venus is in a in a happy place in Pisces, the uh, there's a Venus Mars square, um, which is just uh, very close and just about to perfect as the month opens. Um, and so there's you know there uh, Mars Mars Venus squares are uh, how should we say erotic, scandalous, and contentious. Um, within relationships, it's really, you know, a mix of those uh, of those three, uh, depending on who you are and what you do. Um, and but that after after whatever, you know, after whatever friction uh, or fire is there, Venus is going to be in a very happy condition um, in Pisces, having passed that square to Mars for a lot of the rest of the month. So even though you know the the relational sphere is uh, is troubled. Uh, at first, um, that's initial, and then he, th things get smoother and smoother. Um, you know, when Venus is in a strong position, um, such as the exaltation in Pisces, um, it's easier to relate to people. It's also easier to enjoy things generally, um, which puts people in a better mood, which makes them easier to relate to. Um, it's just, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot to be said with venus and the the concept of lubrication just making things run smoothly right no no shrieking gears or friction um and so once we get past that you know there's there's some there's a nice you know there's uh <laughs> there's enough engine oil for the uh for a lot of the month yeah it looks like that um venus mars square goes exact not long before the full moon that happens on the 5th of February in Leo. So it seems like that full moon part of the signature really is that Venus Mars uh, square that you mentioned and some of the tensions between those two planets. Um, not to mention the placement of Uranus, which is like very closely square, the degree of the full moon at 16 degrees of Leo, and Uranus is at 15 degrees of Taurus. So there is, on the one hand, that full moon has that unexpected surprise or that rebelliousness or that drive for freedom type component with the square from Uranus. And then at the same time, we have that tension between Venus and Mars. What were those keywords that you used for that, Austin? Those were really good at the beginning. Oh, um, what did I say? I said that Venus Mars is erotic, scandalous, and oh, there was a third word, um, contentious. Contentious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think those are really good keywords for that because the, you know, Mercury and Mars, Mercury or sorry, Mars in Gemini has been kind of like argumentative. Like Gemini is already a, a very talkative sign, and putting Mars in there, there's just been more of like a debate dynamic. Um, having Venus though move into the superior square and trying to like smooth out some of what Mars is doing. 
Um, one of the questions is like how successful Venus can be, you know, at getting Mars to kind of like calm down and make peace after a period of sort of intense argumentativeness or contentiousness. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's looking at at the Mars and Gemini. Like, I think it's it, it it's a pretty obvious and immediate immediate metaphor to to reach to to go to like Mars in a in a word based sign or a sign that has to do with words. So it's swords or spicy words or fighting words. Um, but I've also right. been thinking about Mars, like Mars's construction. Mars is the builder. So Mars has been busy, busy doing the demo part of the remodeling project. And now Venus is in like, great, cool. You tore down that wall. Time for the interior decoration. This would make this prettier. Thanks for tearing that down. Uh, still need you to knock down that one last wall or haul out this debris. Definitely. It's time to start building something now that you've sort of destroyed everything over over a period of time. And like, what does the, the rebuilding, the redecorating effort look like? Mm -hmm. And one thing that stands out to me is thinking about the fact that the new moon had Venus, the new moon in Aquarius that we've already experienced, had Venus really close to Saturn. Um, and now with the full moon, that full moon squares the last eclipse. So we're like midway from one eclipse to the next eclipse. Um, and now Venus is is forming a trine to one node and a sextile to the other node. Um, and so it feels like that Venusian artistic um, the beauty, the diplomacy, the lubrication. Um, I'll leave that one there with the third deck in a Pisces, but the lubrication seems like it's also very um, useful to the things that Mars is trying to get us back into engaging. Yeah, that's I, a really I think, good uh, point. Yeah, that, like the, um, I think that that's a really good way to think of it in terms of, so Mars has done all of this stuff, right? A lot of it demo, um, but Mars still has, and in some cases, the work that a that is ahead of Mars is now very certain, right? Um, and so, with um, you know, with Venus coming in, there's sort of like what can be decorated because this room has been demoed, so now we can like sweep out the debris. Um, versus like what you know, Mars is again very certain in its course now. Um, <clears throat> or you know, if you think about it on an individual level, if someone is that Mars retrograde. They spent months like kind of figuring out what the way forward was, and now they're certain and beginning uh, like uh, a, 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 a heavy-footed trudge um, with a great degree of certainty in that direction. Um, and some some of what Venus has to offer be like, well, but what if we just relaxed, or what if da da da? Mars is like, no, going in this direction. But you know, mm. like both sides, like because Mars is so certain now, it's like yes, like this room can be. Uh, can be made livable now. No, like leave that room alone. That that whole side of the building has to come down. And it's by the way, it's really funny that um, you know you, uh, you you basically brought the image of a sledge right for doing demo. Um, part of a big part of my Mars and Gemini activity routine has been um, swinging uh, swinging maces, nice. right? Which are base and uh, f to warm up, I use a sledgehammer and then I use heavier maces. But it's you know three feet of stick with a heavy on the end mm -hmm. um so that's that's funny i like that you mentioned so this is the halfway point between eclipses uh this full moon in leo and while it's not itself an eclipse because it's um the next square after the uh eclipses that occurred in october and november this is going to be like the next turning point or development um, that will build into the next set of eclipses, especially the next one in Scorpio, uh, three months from now. Mm -hmm. So um, whatever was started, if there was some sort of major turning point or thing that was begun under the eclipses in October or, and November, because usually I say those represent a great beginning or great ending, mm -hmm. um, the next phase in that story is going to happen now at these eclipses, which are square to the nodes, or at these this lunation, which is square to the nodes. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the you know since November of twenty twenty one, the eclipses have been kind of picking up and pulling in parts of the Saturn Uranus square, mm -hmm. and this feels like the last lunation that's going to really be plugged into that. And now we finally get to go like great. Cool. Finally done with the Saturn Uranus square. What do I take forward from this? How do I? How do I graduate? Like the exit exam is happening now, and then we get to be done and await our results. That's a really great point. 
Um, and it's and so the lunation itself is happening in Leo, so it's really sh shedding a light on a part of that fixed sign axis that otherwise hasn't been emphasized. You know, of, of all the fixed signs, you know, Scorpio has been getting hit by eclipses, and it has the South Node transiting through it. Taurus has Uranus going through it, and it has the North Node, and then Aquarius has Saturn going through it over the past three years. Leo is the only sign that otherwise. Is a little bit like unrepresented in terms of the fixed signs and all those heavy transits, but here we have a light being shown or like a spotlight on that that part of the zodiac and that part of our charts. All of a sudden, that's kind of like tying in and maybe showing how that piece of it, while it hasn't been the main emphasis, that there's still stuff going on in the Leo sectors of our charts as well that's tied in with that greater cluster of stuff. Yeah, it really shines a light on how the Leo sector has been. Affected by all of the all of the, you know the the fallout and all of the uh, the cries coming from the other fixed signs, right? Because right. Leo 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 is not the site of these things, but it's certainly been affected tremendously by it. Well, and, and you know now that I think of that, and that's going to be a precursor to this summer when we're going to get that Venus retrograde in Leo, and then all of a sudden Leo is going to become. Uh, while it may have been underplayed in the past, will become one of the highlighted signs and highlighted sectors of each of our charts for this entire year, because that's going to be a really major retrograde there that will take place over a 40-day period this summer. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. is that? Like June to July, August-ish? I think it's in August. Well, yeah, and it's. I think it's almost, it's almost four months of Venus and Leo. I actually have a graphic. Here it is. Shout out to... Yeah, so shout out to Stella from Reddit who designed this graphic for us. So the whole phase, including the shadow periods, is like June 19th to October 7th, but the actual retrograde starts at 28 Leo on July 22nd, and it retrogrades back to 12 degrees of Leo on September 3rd. So this lunation, this full moon that's happening here in February is a nice precursor to that because it's just a little... Sort of like priming the pump or kind of uh giving us a little heads up that the the Leo sector of our charts is going to be receiving some action this year and that's going to get a lot louder um this summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially um with Saturn leaving Aquarius just into March. Um any part of the chart that's Leo, any planets in Leo, those have been locked down by Saturn for you know two and a half, three years. Right. And so and you know, Saturn um Saturn often keeps things from changing quickly or smoothly. You know, Saturn Saturn is the slow death. Um, whereas the same planets in in Leo have also been getting um, you know elephant goaded by Uranus in um, uh, Uranus and Taurus to go faster, go faster, change, change, change. Um, and so with Saturn about to leave, like the new dynamic for the leo house planets in leo is just going to be uranus and it's um you know doubly it's of double importance because uh uranus is in taurus therefore answers to venus and it is venus that will be in leo for a third of the year mm -hmm. right so that like that like latent change or the changes that were probably going to happen that there's abundant evidence of things heading towards those um those are scheduled for this year and they're like chris said there's like a shadow of that um during this full moon but then the main show is later in the year um mm -hmm. you know uh june july august september yeah it's interesting that we're talking about this because like the you know venus neptune conjunction i think is going to be quite important and i was I was listening um to the <clears throat> re-listening to the year ahead forecast to to prep for this and pulling a couple of themes and thinking about, yeah, Saturn moving into Pisces is going to be this really significant um, moment of making the dream real. And Venus mm. joining up with Neptune now seems like it's part, it's like this last chance for Venus and Neptune to be super dreamy and idealistic and just in the image and moved and affected without Saturn there harshing totally. that whole mellow. So Before I think I like, like a bucket of cold water gets dumped on it in March when Saturn moves into Pisces. Yeah, yeah, so it's almost like this 
it's not quite the right metaphor, but it has it feels like this kind of inception quality. Like if we can if we can think about the Neptunian impulses that are coming through Venus this first week, then we can spend those four months that Venus is retrograding thinking about what is this great work that we're I'm going to create when next year, you know? So it feels like it's it's a lot of subtle premonitions. It's got that Neptunian foggy, subtle impression y imagination thing going on. Yeah. And that that Venus Neptune conjunction in Pisces that you're talking about actually goes exact around the time of Valentine's Day. It goes exact actually on February 15th to the day after, but it's very, very close essentially on Valentine's Day. And that becomes one of the signatures for Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it's paired uh, it's paired with the sun's conjunction with Saturn, mm -hmm. right. um, which is really interesting because they both occur at the same time, um, but they're they're not relating at all, right? They're not like mutually aspecting. Mm -hmm. um, you have, you know, it's two houses on the block, and one of them is having, I don't know, like a VR poetry orgy, and then the <laughs> <Sales>. the other, <laughs> yeah, the other is like listening to the collected lectures of henry kissinger uh, it's very <laughs> you know sat sun saturn real politic like <laughs> shit mm -hmm. that's so funny that you mentioned that because i actually found a book i was trying to get a book on ai and i got a book from oh yeah it was like the the founder one of the the ceo one of the past ceos of google eric schmidt and i got the book because it had his name on it but then it was like co-written by henry Kiss kissinger and it was all about like the geopolitical implications of ai and how like countries needed to get on top of this because it was going to re reshape the world in terms of whoever was in control of it anyway it's mm -hmm. funny that you mentioned that just because the sun saturn conjunction you're right that's very much that but it's very different than the venus neptune conjunction and the sort of dreamy uh sort of erotic or romantic sort of qualities of that that are, are so different from the harsh reality and the sort of like pessimism of the Sun Saturn conjunction that's happening over in Aquarius at the same time. It's weird that we're also getting um, some moon aspects, some very different moon aspects on the same day on Valentine's Day. Not to like dwell on it too much, but the day begins pretty positively and pretty optimistically with this moon in early Sagittarius applying to a trine with Jupiter. Um, but once it clears that, uh, trying with Jupiter that's more positive and optimistic. It's like applying to an opposition with Mars all day. So there's a little bit of a potential for some like some arguments, some some blowups, some emotionally uh, sort of quick responses on that day. Um, whereas the the day after is really the day where with that Venus Neptune conjunction going exact, it's like a little bit smoother. Maybe we can postpone mm -hmm. Valentine's Day this year. Do you think people would go for that? Just put it off like one day. I mean, I've tried. You've tried. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I have. I have a very well developed case for why Valentine's Day is um, terribly scheduled as a holiday. Um, you know, we should be doing it based on you know. It should, at the very least, it should be like Sun in a Venus ruled sign. Or what I'd initially suggested was, how about the day every year where the Sun occupies Venus's degree of exaltation. Right mm. at the end of Pisces, mm. that's St. Patty's Day, which already has green and kissing and drinking. So that's already like a Venusian holiday, right? Uh. We strip out the like the nation state that it's associated with. It's literally like green, which is very often Venus, like kiss me, I'm Irish, right? Yeah. Like kissing, <laughs> like you're supposed to have an awesome time. And so, yeah, I need to talk to the uh the irish people in government about maybe making that a more universal venusian day because that seems a lot more fun than like eh, it's sun at the end of aquarius you know it's a real it's a real right. party yeah that's really and it could be like easter where easter is what it's like the sunday that follows the like ingress of the sun into aries after like x date or something like that so it's like a mo moving we date. should make it complicated enough that they need an right. astrologer to schedule it for them right? yeah i mean yeah. i'm i like i love a good a, a well calculated uh movable feast but yeah it uh it's first full first full moon after the sun does the the vernal equinox and then it's the sunday following that which if you're celebrating a resurrection, like that's very well timed, right? The mm -hmm. day has just begun to outpace the night. You've had the brightest night with a full moon, and then you're going to hit the day of the sun. 
like w- good design, good design yeah. <laughs> to celebrate a resurrection. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why can't we do that for Venus? All right. Well, let's start a petition and let's see if we, we can get all the astrologers on the same page about like what astrological alignment needs to be on Valentine's Day in the future. Let us know in the comments below this video on YouTube. Um, so going back, um, other aspects, one of the things we also need to talk about because we kind of skipped to the second week is just Mercury is going to be clearing its shadow degrees and clearing the last decan of Capricorn during the first week and a half of the month. So it's on the one hand, it's like retreading that old ground for the third time, wrapping things up in a nice little picture, nice little bow, but also finishing that Mercury Pluto conjunction in Capricorn on February 10th. Um, and that's the one that we talked about that's always all those Mercury Pluto hard aspects often have this really intense quality to their communication, often trying to get to the bottom of things sometimes having to do with disclosures and other stuff like that. Um, I know it's like some of the stuff in the news, it seems like everybody's having like top secret documents like found at their private residences at this point, like first with Biden and then now more recently with Pence. And that may be tied to this whole Mercury retrograde conjunct Pluto combination that's happening at the same time. Um, what are some so, other key keywords for well, this? Yeah, so what's really interesting about that, I think I mentioned this when we talked about it before, but I've been thinking about it. Um, so um, in the triplicity system of reckoning planetary rulers for decans, Mercury gets the third decan of Capricorn. And the the like what that looks like in practice is <clears throat> um is the uh the issuing of an authoritative order or edict. It's like an executive order, it's a decree, it's an edict, it's an official policy. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of times I think of that in terms of when I'm going to uh, nail myself to a particular, you know, structure of work or I'm going to get this done by then, et cetera, et cetera, and nailing that down uh, ritually or otherwise. But it, what's interesting is um, the, the, the Mercury retrograde, which began with this. Um, yeah, which began with Mercury in this decan and is then moving back by the second week of February. It's about like these official documents, right? Like the there's uh, the last part of Capricorn is about is often about like official sanctioned uh, power and Mercury with these these documents that are so uh, so we say so authoritative, so important that you're not allowed to do this or that with them um, is really fascinating. That is really fascinating. I just keep the word forensic keeps coming to mind. Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's uh, part of that. Yeah, that's the the Pluto part, right? Like the hidden, the like, um, is it dead or not, right? And the like, the the digging things up from the underworld is very Pluto, right? I, I often teach and think about Pluto less as a character, like a lot of the planets, but more like. Um, more like a gateway to the underworld, like a cave mouth or hell mouth, where you can both descend into that sort of universe B, um, but then you there are also things that aren't part of this world or you thought were long uh, gone, which emerge out of nowhere. And in this case, it's mercurial stuff, right? Communications, especially authoritative communications. Interesting. Just thinking about the fact that that Pluto is, you know, it's like Pluto return of the U.S. and there's been um somewhat recently and i ask everyone's forgiveness i cannot remember which specific tribal nation this was and which boarding school um but there's been more and more use of like ground penetrating radar to to examine the the grounds around the various like boarding schools and residential um boarding schools here in north america and so that kind of like exhuming and noticing of the, mm-hmm. the dead in relation to the the founding of the u.s specifically and and all of that, I think, be curious to see if there are any official edicts. Think, especially since um, it was only this year that the first uh, Alaska Native, at least, was elected to Congress. So there's like finally representation for one of the the last kind of outposts that was colonized, um, and how much of that stuff is going up further north, but tying into to the founding of the U.S. I wonder if there's more of that kind of forensics leading to revelations, and if we'll see any official edicts or rulings about that either now or when mercury is back in capricorn at the end of the year 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because that's really, in a lot of cases, there will be a lot of circumstantial evidence of um, uh, um, uh, 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 institutional wrongdoing. But it's when you find the like the the order to do X, Y, and Z that's really damning, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then it was that Mercury and Pluto, like you were saying, the you know, uh, and the literally like finding out where the bodies are buried with that being in the second house of the U S like literally the cost of this, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, and even if it doesn't, you know, in a sense, change things, there's a changing of perspective and the, like, this was the real cost, which changes, you know, perspective on where we are and who we are and what this is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or at least informs it, even if it doesn't change it, like that wouldn't surprise me, but, um, you know, like having the actual death toll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the way that that's like a part of the material substance and creation of the U.S. Or even like I happen to favor the Howland chart, which gives a late Virgo rising, so it's still the same angularity. But thinking about the fact that oh, then that would be fifth house, and yeah, it's about children. It's not about adults Ooh, that are being found. Yeah, and is that still on July fourth, seventeen seventy six? Is just a different time, or is it a different date? Different time. Howland gives a ten fifty five a.m., and he actually cites some Library of Congress research and. Basically, it was like Jefferson was a drunk. It's more likely that he was drunk and misremembered and that they chose something that happened when there was daylight than doing something late. Um, he also does some local space lines and connects it back to William's coronation and Virginia Charter. Um, mm-hmm. American Histrology is the book published by AFA. Um, I actually have it here. This guy, um, oh, Ronald thanks. Howland. Um, tons and tons and tons of timed charts uh, for a lot of different U- uh, events in U.S. history. So it's a good one for folks who are doing research and mundane work. But it's it's uh, interesting just running through it. Uh, the Mars in the fourth, and then the Sun, uh, Sun, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus in the eleventh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have it up right now. I'll pull it up. Yeah, but yeah. Saturn, Saturn in the second, but a good strong Saturn in the second. That that tracks. Uh, it's American histrology. Like if you combine the word history and astrology in some beastly abomination. Yeah. Histrology. Astro- astrologers and their, their cute astrology book titles. Yes. Very long standing tradition. I'm sure they were doing that in like the Mesopotamian tradition with like cuneiform tablets. Like there was some putting together of goofy words that uh, some astrologer put on some tablet back in the day, I'm sure. Yeah, maybe they were like 12 places, the 12th part. What is wrong with you guys over there? Right. Um, I'm just trying to like cast the chart really quickly while we're talking. About the, uh, what time? 10.55 a.m. local time. All right. So that would give a chart. It looks like this-ish. More mm-hmm. or less, twenty-seven Virgo rising. Neptune would be on the ascendant in Virgo. The Cancer stellium would shift to the eleventh uh, whole sign house with Venus, Jupiter, Sun, and Mercury there. The midheaven would be late. Actually, it looks a lot like um, what's his name's chart, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's chart, um, with the like late Virgo with Mars up there in Gemini in the tenth by the midheaven. Uh, it would put the Mars Mars Uranus conjunction in the tenth whole sign house, which is very interesting. I was thinking about that Mars Uranus conjunction recently, and just like that that probably being the signature for like gun violence in the U.S. and why it mm-hmm. stands out so much more here than it does in other countries. Mm-hmm. And the Moon in Aquarius down in this sixth whole sign house. Yeah, and even like you know Mercury ruling the chart in the eleventh. Like we, if we idolize anything, it's money currency is is our god Mm, okay well and just yeah the like frantic um travel and uh commerce right like mercury like the merc in uh commerce is mercury um but yeah like it makes the um the keeping the mutable rising makes sense because we do there is like a tremendous jupiter and a tremendous mercury quality to the american thing Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was just thinking about it the other day, and I think I might have even tweeted about it. Something like, you know, I don't think that this Jupiter transit through Aries is a is um, 
is an 11th house transit for the US, it seems much more like we are having an, a very large expansion of 8th house topical experiences. With all the mm -hmm. shootings that are going on recently in particular. Although it is pervasive, so it's hard to pin something like that to current transits when it's kind of always happening. Yeah, especially right. like, like anytime anything happens with Mars, there's a shooting in the US. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking of actually relevant, I meant to show um, I, I read this article. It's actually it was like a month ago now, but still relevant. But it was on inflation, and it was showing how um, through the efforts that like the Fed has made, how inflation is starting to decline. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because re like remember J Jupiter? We talked so much about Jupiter and Pisces being about inflation, and that started back in like 2021, right around here, right, right around spring of 2021 when jupiter first dipped into pisces and you can just see on the graph like the inflation like shooting up over the course of the next year from that point but now by december of 2022 we finally get to the very end of jupiter and pisces jupiter starts moving away from that conjunction with neptune and we're starting to see hopefully what will continue as a trend and a decline in the inflation rate so that's a pretty nice little a little astrological correlation there. I like when things line up like that, and you can like take an astrological alignment, especially an outer planet one, and compare it to a graph of some like objectively occurring data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's nicely matchy matchy. Yeah, very nice. All right, so we've talked about most of the alignments for the first week. Is there anything else in the first week we need to mention? Are we firmly in? Week two, we've talked about Valentine's Day. Um, so Merc Mercury does complete its journey through Capricorn finally, finally, finally on February 11th, and it moves into the sign of Aquarius. Um, so that's the beginning of that transit, just emphasizing the Aquarius stuff that we've already been experiencing and talking about, and it will eventually meet up with Saturn at the end of Aquarius before Saturn departs from there. So it's like we're getting the last outer planet, the last inner planet conjunctions with Saturn are basically happening over the course of this month. Um, the Sun-Saturn conjunction probably being the most notable and important one because this is going to be the last Sun-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius on February 16th for almost you know 30 years until Saturn goes all the way around the zodiac and comes back to Aquarius. So there's something about that as being like a final ending point for that transit. Yeah, I think that I think it's really I think with Mercury and Aquarius with Saturn right before it's done and with every all of the big stuff that happens in March um I I think that trying to use this uh this time with Mercury and Aquarius um to take a very like cold look at what's happening and where we are um before things ju before things jump into the foreground and get busy and distracting again would be of great benefit mercury does well in aquarius it does especially well in the middle decan of aquarius and of course saturn's the ruler of aquarius um you know saturn in aquarius provides this you know like stark winter vista like frozen silent um quiet um uh, both silent and quiet um but like unbusy if chilly um type of perspective um and saturn pisces is going to be wild and sloppy um and so i feel like you know appreciating the stillness of winter um, you know, you go outside during a, like a frozen day and everything is just so stark and you can, you know, you can hear a deer like walking through the snow a hundred feet away if there's no street noise. Um, but like that with time, right. And we think of deep time, we think about longer cycles. It, it is, it's chilling in the sense that if you go back enough cycles, there are always a multitude of horrors. Um, but there's also a pulling away from immediate hot emotional reaction. So it's chilly in that sense too. Like if you're looking at the earth from space, right? Space is very cold and clear and stark. Um, and it's less, um, less winter is coming, 
but like, what does it mean? You know, what is it meant to, to be in winter? I was thinking about, I was thinking about this. I was, you know, I did some, some Saturn work with uh, Kate the other day, but my mind was really on Saturn and Saturn and Aquarius. Um, and so in the lead up to, you know, Saturn in its two signs that it rules, right? Saturn in Cap, Saturn in Aquarius, um, the most popular television show in the world told us repeatedly to remember that winter is coming, right? And now, um, like kind of at the end of if if astrological winter is the two, you know, the two signs in a row where Saturn's in its home place and coldest, as cold as possible and as hard as possible, like what does it mean to be leaving that? And it, it struck me something like the memento mori, like remember death, but like remember winter, right? As you leave winter, like remember winter, like winter is coming is not appropriate to say on the third day of spring. Right. But like, remember winter, like carry the memory of winter with you through the next cycle. Yeah. Mm. Cause we're, we're both carrying the memory. It's like appreciating the stillness of finishing the end of a chapter of a book before you begin the next one or finishing like one season of a television series before you like start binge watching another one. We're finishing this three year long Saturn and Aquarius transit that started in March of 2020. And it's like when you place it within that context and like realize the closeness to the start of the pandemic and what that meant for so many different people and how that affected different people in so many different ways in different areas of, of our lives, it really starts to put you into perspective what this month of February is about. Because as soon as we start in March, basically Saturn goes into Pisces on the 7th already. So that transit is, is done. Uh, and February really is the last looking back and setting into motion or completing that which has been set into motion over the course of the last three years in that part of our chart or that part of our life, especially that house, I think, or that whole sign house mm -hmm. that it matches with in each of our charts. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, have either of you had like personal reflections about what that's meant for you in terms of your chart or have you seen other people? I mean, I had. You know, obviously, we use like the Miley Cyrus example earlier as a tenth house Saturn transit, and how that's gone in terms of her career, and then her looking back potentially now with a sense of like accomplishment and and success of like putting in the hard work and now reaping the benefits of that. Um, you know, for me, it's been since March of 2020 the the ongoing struggle with like health issues and like coming to terms with that and trying to find ways to work with that and adjust to um dealing with some of that stuff and finding different ways to manage it and stuff like that um that's what i'm looking back and reflecting on with saturn completing its transit through my first house over the course of this this time period um do either of you have any like reflections like that i do they're they're very mundane it's my eighth and so <clears throat> with uh, that eighth second polarity it's been a lot about like getting organized money wise, like dealing with taxes. Like right now, um, I'm, um, fully, I'm not afraid of tax season coming up because over the last couple of years, um, <coughs> I, I went into the abyss and got, became fully mature and responsible for eighth house, what you owe the government. Like that's, you know, have a, have an accountant, blah, blah, blah. Like which is, you know, literally was a great source of fear, right? Saturn, um, and is, you know, a uh, bunch of laws that you, a bunch of rules you have to comply to, et cetera, et cetera. But like very, very eighth house, like my eighth house is much more mature. Um, and I'm no longer, uh, terrified of, <laughs> of the doings in that place as I was before the Saturn Aquarius transit began. Well, when you've also gone through a period in which you're spouse and their like financial income has changed pretty dramatically as well as just through the work intense amount of work but also success um, that they've had with sphere and sundry that caitlin's had with sphere and sundry and you're telling me just earlier this morning that you you started getting up earlier because it's like she's you know working nine to five on her business and so it helps your sick your schedules to sync better if you're also like getting up early each every day even though you don't have that personally that like grounding thing that's making you do it um but that's kind of an interesting connection there as well yeah yeah totally um yeah the um a lot has happened um with my 
uh, with my par with my partner's resources, right? right. The, which is the eighth house, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and that's um, and so much has happened that that's been like Saturn, like um, a, a center of gravity in life, because so much is going on right there, and so much has been changing with uh, that that Saturn being hit by the Uranus over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, how has it been for you, Barry? Or have you, or, or if even if not that, if you've seen other people, other contemporaries going through some of that transit? Um, it's been pretty, pretty big for me. Um, <clears throat> I have my chart ruler in Sectolite in Aquarius. It's also an eighth house transit for me. Um, I also have a four planet Leo Stellium, so it's been like the vast majority of my chart being very persistently activated. Um, and I was actually just, just realizing, I think I, I spoke on Kira's podcast with Sam about the second and eighth house in 2020. Um, maybe it was early 2021, but it's been most of Saturn moving through Aquarius. And I've been thinking a lot about that. I've got a really positive response from folks, um, based on that episode, but I've been doing a lot of thinking about the derived houses and especially the relationship between the fifth and the eighth. Um, you know, with my family being indigenous and thinking about like, okay, the eighth house is fourth from the fifth. How is the eighth house the the home or the roots or the origins of pleasure? How is death the origins of pleasure? Um, and I was like, oh, right, my people have potlatch. When someone dies, we literally throw a big party, have a feast, and gift away their possessions to their friends. Like, you don't hoard it and inherit it to the next person, to the, like their next descendants. That's just not how we do things. Mm. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about that and just zooming back realizing oh this whole process of Aqu of saturn moving through aquarius has been a lot about me solidifying that understanding and figuring out how to bring like so in terms of the eighth house i've been thinking a lot about it as it's actually our shared investment like yes there's the resources and the joint assets but it's any type of joint enterprise like sharing investing your caring like having foxes to give that isn't that's in a deposit into the eighth house as well. Um, so if someone's willing to give you your t their time, their attention, their energy, their caring at all, that becomes eighth housey. So I feel like that's what's been maturing for me. Yeah, there's the taxes and there's the money stuff. And I worked as an accountant. And um, you know, on the other side of Saturn's transit, I, I think I'm almost successfully completely transitioned out of working for other people and all of my time and all of my money being quote my own. Um, yeah, but which I has think been it's... huge in terms of making the transition to doing astrology full time, and that being your primary profession and, and income source at this point. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's hard and scary, and it takes a really long time. And you know, um, I, I'm sure that will continue to be a long term process that I'll, I'll talk about and share with folks. But I think the uh, getting mature with respect to understanding how much. You're carrying the words you say that like the time that you give to just caring about your friends or your family or their projects, those are just as material um, in the big picture. And I think mm -hmm. that it takes, I don't know that that's the type of thing that my 20 something year old self could have processed, even if somebody explained it well. I think it's a thing that you have to have enough time with. Yeah, that's such a huge component of Saturn transits. Is it something that even if somebody explains it to you, while you may have some understanding of it abstractly or intellectually going into it, the actual experiential value of living through it is so um, much different than just an intellectual understanding that there, that it can't be replaced and it can't fully be replicated. It's just something you have to learn through an, ex an experience. Yeah, the um. Uh, in terms of the, as I say, the investment um, on of one, on one's part into the eighth, right? Which could be a share, you know, which is a shared thing in some way, right? Um, could literally be, you know, how much you're paying attention to what your partner is doing. Could be part of a larger project that you're doing a role in with other people, but the like you're you're you know you're you're giving stuff, resources of various sorts to that, and you know, as I was thinking about Saturn the other day, um, you know, Saturn is very time and space. And I was just, it really struck me that space is, even if you give up space um, or, you know, territory, um, in the future, you can get territory back 
but the difference is time time is never you never recoup time uh, whatever time you're giving is a it's a permanent gift right there's no take backsies with time yeah i think that was actually a huge part of our like a digression we had in the aquarius episode that we just did about saturn hmm. um and the, it, that felt, it felt it felt yeah it felt very that felt because i was trying to feel out the difference between saturn and capricorn and aquarius and this is a little bit of uh, it's a slightly hyperbolic but like saturn and capricorn is much more space and saturn and uh, aquarius feels much more like time mm -hmm. yeah another way we were talking about it was that saturn and capricorn seemed like it was more looking backwards in time and sometimes idealizing that versus aquarius was more forward looking in time and like idealizing some you know period in the future where like everything will be better or great or what have you or or looking back with horror and looking forward with horror too <laughs> you know there's also yes. always that <laughs> definitely um, that i realized in talking and hearing both of your stories part of what my lesson is right now that i've been internalizing in the past recent weeks and few days especially was just like learning my limits and like the limits of my physical health and how that has to be respected despite my career aspirations and like desire to sometimes have these I did um, a series of like four or five podcast episodes the past week, and some of them were like four or five hour, or in one case with Rob Bailey, we recorded a new seven hour lecture on the history of horary for this new horary course that we're building. Uh, but I think I'm kind of like wrecked after this episode, and I need to start maybe doing shorter, you know, more reasonable two hour episodes um, here, which as I look at the clock right now, I realize I'm not doing a good job of because we're at two hours and four minutes at the moment, but learning to balance that a little bit more in terms of my normal younger person desires to just like talk about astrology forever versus my current late thirties Saturn in the first house transit, you know, actual self that needs to maybe put some better limits and restrictions on things. I'm all for it. Uh, I okay. will also add, I got one of those from Saturn and Aquarius as well. I've been in a, an Aquarius perfection since last March. So mm. it's, you know, it's first house of my perfection has been Aquarius and um, I got the first real injury that I've had in a long time. Shortly after that began, uh, I got, I, I tore, uh, I did like a mild tear of a muscle in my calf. Again, look at the, look at the little Zodiac man. Where does Aquarius point to? It points to the shins and calves. Um, and I was, it was literally, I was just overtraining like crazy and then trying to do very athletic things. And um, in the middle of a kick, uh, I landed on uh, the left as, a, as the support leg and the tendons were just like, fuck you. And so then I walked like Saturn, you know, Saturn is very often uh, walking with a limp or with a crutch. Um, like I walked funny for a couple of weeks and it probably took two months to rehab it so that I could actually do normal things with the calf. Um, and so thank you, Saturn and Aquarius, for striking the Aquarius part of my body. And it made me just reflect on Saturn, the two parts of the body that Saturn rules, knees and then um, shins down to the feet. Um, those are uh, those show aging, right? People, um, the, it's the tendons and muscles in the knees on down um, that people injure as they get older because those get tighter. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I learned that the, the kind of muscle thing that I had was often referred to as like, a as a tennis injury that was most common in middle-aged people trying to play tennis, right? Where you're, you're using, you're like changing directions really quickly, right? It's literally like, oh, it's like, oh, I wasn't tennis, but that's exactly what I was doing. And you know, everybody like the, like, if you want to cosplay as an old person, you complain about your knees, right? Like, that's just a given. Mm -hmm. But I'd never thought about the shins, <laughs> you know, like that area of the body as being specifically related to age in the same way. For sure. Uh, well, I would love it. Thanks for sharing those stories. I would love it if people watching this episode could let us know in the YouTube comments what you've learned from Saturn and Aquarius, especially how that relates to the house that it's been transiting through your chart over the past three years or potentially any like natal planets that it's aspected during that time. That'd be really interesting to see as we're getting towards the end of that transit here. All right, so let's transition into talking about the second half of the month. So those two major conjunctions that fall in the middle of the month, uh, first the, the like romantic Venus-Neptune conjunction on the 15th, followed by the 
more sober Sun Saturn conjunction on the 16th, those really culminate there. And then over the next few days, we have a pretty major shift where the Sun goes into Pisces on the 18th. And then we get that new moon in Pisces immediately after that on the 20th, um, which roughly coincides with Venus departing from Pisces and moving into Aries. So that really brings us to that that second lunation of the month, which is that new moon in Pisces. Why don't we why don't we talk about that? Yeah, it's a really big tonal shift that last um, third quarter of the month. Um, you know, it it uh, you know it leaves behind a lot of the leaves leaves behind the solar spotlighted focus on Saturn. Mercury's still there, so there's still that like colder, more eternity or you know more timeline seeking quality of thought. But yeah. the, the well, and it's hard because it's also like still three degrees away from Saturn, so it's like it's really tough because it's like um, it's getting away from Saturn by sign, and yet Saturn is not far b- behind from moving into Pisces, right? But it, it's 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 on it. It's um, very much moving away, right? Yeah. It's like in a different environment. It's now in like a watery, much less boundaried environment. We've still got Venus and Neptune in Pisces. Like that's mm-hmm. the beginning. Of uh, yeah, of of the the last third, we have more like quarter of the month where we're gonna have Venus move into Aries shortly thereafter, and then it's Venus Jupiter time in outgoing Aries, like very very different from um uh, from the the focus on that that sort of uh, uh, cold retrospective um, with Saturn. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's nice that Venus is still there, so we get that Venus and Pisces still kind of baked into the. New moon in Pisces here um, on the twentieth. Uh, what else is going on that's sort of relevant? Mercury is just coming off of a somewhat balancing optimistic sextile with Jupiter from twelve Aquarius to twelve uh, or nine degrees of Aries um, before it heads sort of headlong into that conjunction with Saturn at the at the end of the month. Yeah, and and that yeah, that Saturn influence is uh, very there, very ambient. But it's Mercury is heading directly into an almost simultaneous aspect with Uranus and Mars. Mm -hmm. So there's like okay, so based on the nature of this moment, this point in the timeline, I need to get this shit done, right? Mm -hmm. With Mars, it's like stuff we've been thinking about doing for a while, and like oh, how is this going to get done? How am I going to handle this? It's like you know Mercury ruling Mars, and then again, getting like cattle prodded by Uranus, like it's very active, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, there, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, if we can kind of use the, the metaphor of translating light as the moon does and think about Mercury there, Mercury is basically like, Hey, Jupiter, I see you're in a Mars ruled sign. You have some ideas about how we can go and how we can expand and like get moving. Uh, right. Let me go like relay the message to Uranus, see if we can just do it instantaneously. Maybe if there's some technology that aids us and like deploy the the battle strategy, like thinking about Mars, if Mars is, you know, a general or something or a soldier, then maybe this is like, okay, we've, we finished some reconnaissance and, and we're relaying the message and then we need to just like implement battle strategy, go, go, go. Yeah, totally. I like that. That's a good point about the translation of light there, the transfer of light from Jupiter to Uranus and Mars, especially because Mars is like moving out of that whole sextile with Jupiter Mm -hmm. and is getting pretty far away. It's like six degrees now, but then Mercury swoops in and is able to to reconnect both of them uh, at this point in in February. Mm -hmm. So the Mercury Uranus square, which happens a couple of days later on February 22nd, though, is a little disruptive in terms of communications and technologies, like unexpected messages and other things like that. Um, It happens, though, not long. It's like the moon goes into Aries not long after Venus does, and then we begin the build up to this Venus Jupiter conjunction which does not go exact in February, but it gets really close by the very end of the month, by the 28th, and then goes exact on the first at first or second around 11, 12 degrees of Aries. So that's kind of a positive shift in terms of the Aries sector of our chart then at this point in the month after the new moon that we get not just Jupiter transiting through Aries, um, but also Venus transiting through and and meeting up with Jupiter there. Mm It, it's very uh it's very glory seeking mm. 
Yeah, Aries, I've been realizing lately, likes to win and it likes to receive recognition or like awards for being the best or being first or being innovative at things. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's generally, yeah. Um, yeah, it's victory or it's, it's a, it's success, but often in a competitive context, right? Yeah. There can only be one who is first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the, the two different sides of, of Mars coming, coming out, like the, the Scorpio brings the passion that you need for success, but it's like the Mars and Aries that's bringing the, the ambition and that drive and like all of those keywords. Yeah. And the, the doing it in front of everyone. Um, I taught, a, a, a class recently on the, just like the, you know, uh, each planet and it's two domiciles, just going after over basic stuff. And, you know, Mars and Scorpio is really like in the natural, in the animal world. Um, right. Like that's, um, it's nocturnal. You hunt almost the vast majority of predators hunt at night and to kill, they fight to kill and eat. Whereas Aries, right, the day side of Mars, you do it in front of everybody. And the point is usually not to kill. It's all of the battling um, that animals do uh, for a place in a dominance and mating hierarchy where that needs to be in front of everybody. And it's often not lethal, right? Um, and that like the, the, it's, it's supposed to be non-lethal and it's supposed to be as visible as possible. Um, and that like that's, you know, that's Aries, right? Um, it's not the secret success that Scorpio is. It's not the like the satisfaction of the owl at three o'clock in the morning when it seizes the rabbit. Mm -hmm. All okay. right. So you're telling our listeners to think of contemplate with Venus going to Aries, your place in the dominance and mating hierarchy. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, but that's like, that's part of that's that stuff. All the shadow of that feeds into like big public wins of like, look at how awesome I am right. look at, and therefore attractive and therefore a hundred other things. That's part of Aries. Like, look at how, look at how great this thing I did is. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And seeking success through those things and through being quick, through being uh, throughout competing, through, you know, being faster or being able to outmaneuver somebody, uh, not necessarily in a, a negative or a manipulative way, but just in demonstrating your qualities in a way that excels maybe above your peers. This could be a good keyword for that last um, part of the month, last 10 days of the month when Venus goes into Aries and begins the build up to that conjunction with Jupiter. Um, how can you achieve success or recognition for some, some, some things, some of your talents through that? Yeah, it's it's a little bit, um, it, you know, it's a point uh, to show off, right? Or if you have something to show off. Um, Christy, I don't know what your electional chart for this month is, but does it involve, does it leverage that Venus Jupiter at all? Uh, of course. I mean, that is, that is okay, the most auspicious thing of the month. So that would be worth mentioning now. Thanks for mentioning that. So this is the electional chart that Lisa Scheim and I came up with for February. It's set for... February 22nd, 2023, around 2 p.m. Uh, local time. We set it for 2 p.m. here in Denver, Colorado. Basically, what you do is take this chart, set it for February 22nd at 2 p.m., just change the city to your location. What you should end up with is a chart that roughly looks like this with Cancer rising. And we have the Moon, Venus, and Jupiter all up there in the 10th whole sign house in the sign of Aries. So we're taking that auspicious Venus-Jupiter conjunction that's still building up at this point in Fe on February 22nd, and we're putting the moon like right there in the middle of all of that, right in the middle of the mix, where it's separating from a conjunction with Venus and applying to a conjunction with Jupiter. And since the moon is the ruler of the ascendant, this should really help to accentuate um, these this this symbolism of like success and achieving one's desired, especially career or other types of ambition goals, since it's emphasizing the 10th house in this chart or in this electional chart, which is the house of career, reputation, and action. Um, so that is the, the primary focus is just really taking advantage of that Venus-Jupiter conjunction this month and making that the focal point by putting the moon there putting the ruler of the ascendant there and putting all of that up in the 10th whole sign house. So it'd be a very good chart for some of the things that we're talking about, including 
just like career and pub public reputation in general this month. Yeah. Yeah, it so, looks looks like a pretty big flex. Right. Yeah, exactly. For just like doing something, taking an action, um, even a bold action, like Aries is also a very bold sign. And it tends to, when it's configured well, like favor the the one who acts boldly and who acts first in order to accomplish something or in order to open up a new area of um, achievement and success. So this is a very good good chart for that, I would think. Yeah, with and especially not only is the moon conjunct Jupiter, but the moon is ruling the ascendant while conjunct Jupiter and Venus in the tenth. So it it pulls the the as the ruler of the ascendant pulls the the person into that glory that's happening into the tenth in the tenth. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that is our primary electional chart for this month. We're also getting ready to on Friday record the next auspicious elections podcast which is one of the um, podcasts that's available privately to our members on patreon so you can find out more information about that at the astrologypodcast.com and we're going to release i think we have at least three or four other electional charts for february that we're going to release in that podcast episode and um, additionally we also released a few months ago our 2023 electional astrology report where we went through and we picked out the single best electional chart we could find for each of the next 12 months of 2023. So that's for people that want to make long-term plans over the course of the next next year. Uh, and you can find out more information about that at the astrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. Uh, finally, we also have our planetary alignments calendar is out and people have been ordering that where all of the graphics we use in this episode that show the planetary alignments we actually have that on a high quality wall poster that you can put up in order to look at the astrology of the next month or the next 12 months at a glance very easily, which is very useful for electional and other types of planning. So you can find out more about that at the astrologypodcast.com slash merch. All right. This is bringing us to the end of the month and the final alignments of the month, which is basically by the end of the month, that Venus-Jupiter conjunction starts getting close and going exact, and that Mercury-Saturn conjunction starts getting very close to going exact. So on the one hand, we have this very like positive, optimistic, um, sort of trailblazing conjunction of Venus conjunct Jupiter and Aries, but then on the other hand, we have this very exacting, um, somewhat pessimistic at the worst but maybe just grounded and pragmatic at the best conjunction of of mercury conjunct saturn that's also happening simultaneously uh what are some of the other keywords for this or, or are there anything else it looks like the mars neptune square is also forming but that's something that won't go exact until the first week of march it's making me think about like accounting and the way that in order to balance a double ledger down to zero pennies difference at the end of the year, you're taking this like really methodical scrutiny and just dissecting the details that Mars Neptune square of like, hmm, there's some fogginess, there's some amb ambiguity or confusion. Let me come with a scalpel and just like dissect this until Mercury and Saturn can like make a proper accounting of it like like a like a bank reconciliation in accounting parlance mm, yeah yeah mercury saturn is really good at that and seeing like the structural errors or problems in something um which can be really highly critical in like a negative sense of like being too negative but in other times it can be really good for things like that like you said like accounting or doing a assessment like a structural assessment of something and if it has a solid foundation or if it it has some work that needs to be done and needs repairs yeah i, I the what came to mind with uh, the venus jupiter is like i don't know like a you've got like a raucous lavish um party or event you know very um balls out as they say but with like mercury like being like running the numbers like embarrassing with accounting like okay can we afford the this the this the this and the this like you know because those are like the merc the venus jupiter is right before it happens the mercury saturn is right before it happens uh and that saturn yeah anyway like mm -hmm. in mercury 
Good joke. Saturn is the ruler of Mars, which is the ruler of Aries, right? Like there's this like uh, holding like this moment, uh, like should I hold back on this like lavish, explosive, pioneering, you know, spectacle? Yeah. Yeah. I, in addition to having been an accountant, I was once a bartender and like, this is like the moment where someone's like, yeah, we plan this elaborate private party and we're going to have these bartenders here and you're going to make these cocktails. And then the bar team shows up and they're like, so you have no drains and I don't know how I'm supposed to have ice. Like you want me to make cocktails without ice? We like, we have plumbing problems. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm not wearing this outfit. Yeah, that's non-starter. That can't happen. We can't bartend in a pool. Did anyone consider this? Um, or if we're thinking about Mars is like that, the, the builder, like, you know, we've done all this demo and like Venus came in and made it really pretty. And the building inspector comes and says like, so this great new bar of yours is, I'm not going to actually give you a permit to open. You need to tear apart everything you just built and make those drains be two inches further apart. These stairs are too steep, and so you can be sued if anyone fall uh, if anyone slips on them. Mm -hmm. They need to be either the angle needs to be you know whatever yeah <laughs> uh, uh, forty degrees rather than forty one degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this um something we've been doing <clears throat> that Lisa and I've been doing on the Auspicious Elections podcast lately is like t imagining an electional chart and if it was like a scenario or a person, and this alignment of like Mercury conjunct Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, versus Venus conjunct Jupiter in Aries at the same time. That's like somebody who's like an accountant in their day job and who builds or leverages technology in order to do accounting for like a large corporation with with Mercury conjunct Saturn and Aquarius. But where like in their free time they really enjoy like skydiving and bungee jumping and like extreme sports like that. That would be my my imagination of what somebody with with that combination has. What what com what what would you imagine as like a hypothetical person that has that combination? I think okay, you, I like the. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say I think you described a real person that I work with in construction construction accounting who is who rock climbs rocks like a rock climber. But even like a lot of folks into rock climbing end up in these very high positions because of the what you have to do to succeed with all that airy stuff. Ooh, okay. Like yeah. the risk taking, the necessary, the needing to have some um not not aversion to risk, but whatever the opposite of that is. Yeah, yeah. Risk mitigation, risk tolerance, risk resiliency. Yeah, tolerance. I like yeah. that. Okay. How about um uh an academic who works on uh translating historical texts who in their spare time um loves doing uh like hema or the his like that was a historical european martial arts which is like sometimes is halfway to larping but like somebody who's like <clears throat> translating these things and then like um re pain painstakingly reconstructing like some of like for example like the in, the one of the incredibly flamboyant lands necked swiss pikeman outfits and walking around with like giant feathers and a you know an 18 foot pike and you know with friends yeah mm -hmm. that's like there there are historians that specialize in um reconstructing like the um fighting styles of like medieval knights and like what their actual tactics would be in a sword fight by translating yeah that's, something. Yeah, that's yeah, what that, you're that's, yeah that's that's the 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 acronym that that goes by hema and then there are schools <laughs> okay that, um, sorry i didn't i'm not yeah, yeah. No. uh um, but yeah, and then there are schools that it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm going to shut up, but yeah, like they actually, um, have reconstructed their, you know, manuals like sword swordsmanship or how to use a mace or whatever, um, manuals. And then uh, people practice those. And mm -hmm. then sometimes they dress up in period costumes. Some of it's not, um, some of it's more combat focused, like, a like training in historical martial art. And then some of it is more, you know, reenactment sort of cosplay, cosplay flavored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. All right. Well, if anybody has that combination, uh, let us know if they have like Mercury, uh, Saturn stuff in Aquarius and Venus, Jupiter or other Aries placements. Let me know what your unique manifestation of that is in your life in the YouTube comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Made me think about Adam Savage. Like, um, okay. Just like the super scientisty but then like okay let's do this exacting thing we're gonna machine it we're gonna make it super perfect and then let's go blow it up 
Totally. That's a really good one. Yeah. Cause there's also like an engineering component often or like a mechanic component to, um, to Aries that's mm -hmm. often surprisingly prominent. Yeah. yeah. And the two, the two, the signs are in sextile. So there should be some like connection between the two activities. Like it's not one for one, but they're, you know, they're like the, it can translate. Totally. That's good. I like that. Well, that is the energy basically that we end the month with, which is a really interesting combination. And especially just with the contrast, because next month is when everything shifts, when Saturn goes into Pisces, but also Mars is going to depart from Gemini and move into Cancer, ending a very long, long transit of Mars going through Gemini since like last August. So it's going to be a month of major shifts. Oh yeah, and we get Pluto moving into into Aquarius. So next month is going to be the month of major shifts, and this is the month of, um, you know, reflecting on how, how far you've come with some of those transits. In the case of, um, you know, Saturn in Aquarius, it's been for the past three years, as we said, since March of 2020. In the case of Mars, it's since last August, and then with Pluto, it's been since what, like 2009, 2008. Basically, 2008. yeah, 2008. Yeah. So a lot of looking back and reflecting on the completion of this chapter of our lives, um, whatever that means for you. And then next month, beginning a new chapter and looking forward to the future. Well, looking at the future, the future. Yeah. <laughs> Experiencing entering the, future. the entering the foyer of the next chapter, right? The, the lobby of this weird like like a weird astrology convention that you've gone to when pluto goes into aquarius mm -hmm. yeah. like imagining like in in the movies where they show some really fancy hoity-toity party and they pull up in their vintage rolls royce like in the circle driveway and then looking and deciding like do i actually want to go into that party should we just go right back out the way we came right was, um yeah the um the animal head masks are making me very uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I actually saw one. There was like they did the Miss USA pageant or Mix Miss Universe, and um, there was a really funny one that I shared the other day. That was like, this is what Pluto moving into Aquarius is going to look like. Was like Miss USA showed up with like a big ball like strapped onto her head, and I think that's something what it's going to look like. Really over the top next month as soon as Pluto goes into Aquarius. Well, it'll it'll be prefaced by um, an AI becoming self aware and then presenting that that image that, that woman's image as as the avatar um, of the ruthless and permanent overlord. You know that actually is really relevant because there was this picture going around on social media a week ago, and it was an image that was like it was like four images, and it was different women like taking selfies at a party, and it just looked like every selfie you have ever seen over the past decade of people using like their smartphones to take a selfie at a party and it just looked very generic and then in the subtitle it said this is ai generated and none of these people are real and it just like it was this big eye-opening moment for like a lot of people that like were entering into like completely uncharted territory where some of this ai stuff can create stuff that looks realistic but just never happened um and i think that's us heading like really quickly into the not just Pluto and Aquarius, but all for the next 20 years, but also that Pluto or that Saturn transit into Pisces and the build up to that conjunction of, with Neptune and just the blurring of like what is real versus not what is not real over the course of the next five to six years. Yeah, it's going to be a long journey through the uncanny valley. For sure. For sure. Well, uh, everybody should enjoy then the next month and reflect on things before we move into that new chapter in world history as well as our personal histories together next month in the uh astrology of march and we'll be back again next month to talk about that uh thank you both for joining me for this today this is amazing we've talked about a lot of stuff um but this is this is great thanks for joining us today bear yeah thank you so much for having me it's been a real pleasure and a, a tremendous honor yeah um what are what do you have going on what do you have coming up tell us more about where people can find information about your work and other offerings and stuff? Uh, it's pretty easy. It's just my name. If you throw an at in front of my name, Bear River, like the animal and the water, but spelled with a Y, then uh, you'll find me all over the internet. <clears throat> um, 
The most immediate thing I have coming up will be happening on February 12th. It's a couple Sundays from now at 6 p.m. I'll be teaching a, an in-person class at Raven's Wing Magic Shop in Oakland, talking about uh, starting a planetary day practice and just some practical, practical pointers for how to enter into that. Um, work with the chart, and then that is likely going to turn into a longer, like seven or eight week course in the uh, later on this year. And then for other than that, I'm working on um on a queer astrology project. It'll be a magazine that gets released uh, later this year, and doing a lot of just background research, building out some courses, and um, mostly study. So I'll be mostly behind the scenes this year, and just writing and being available to students. Nice. And you do consultations as well? Yeah, consultations. Books are always open. I've got uh, sliding scale donations, and I also have a uh, don pay by donation set up. It's something I've been doing all of my practice, but since some recent Jupiter work, it is a very permanent part of my practice. So I'm excited about um, offering those services to folks and figuring out ways to collaborate and create more accessible services. Brilliant. All right. Well, people can check out your website at bearriver.com, and I'll put a link to it in the description below this video on YouTube or on the podcast website for this episode. Uh, Austin, what do you have coming up? Well, um, there is a an Antares series that's coming out by Sphere and Sundry ooh, um, first week of February. Um, it was and Antares is one of the four royal stars. It's the the heart of the Scorpion constellation. Uh, in with the Chinese like macro constellations, it's the heart of the the Azure Dragon. Um, it's pretty great. And we got the Moon conjunct it trying Jupiter last year. Um, it's Antares is the rival of Mars. You know, red star that has um similar qualities to Mars, although on that that stellar level. I'm very excited about that. There's a lot of drive. We didn't want to release that when Mars was retrograde to make sure that that drive of that intensity would go out once direction was uh, was certain. Um, and so Kate uh, created a bunch of cool stuff there. There are a bunch of good su sub series. We've got the Heart of the Emperor Scorpion, the Honey Badger sub series. Uh, as well as the uh, the Azure Dragon, as well as um, vanilla flavored Antares, so I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I've been playing with that; it's been really good. Other than that, I'm going to be as invisible as possible because I am driving to get um, the rewrite slash rework of Thirty Six Faces done uh, by April. So I'm um, got some good momentum and intend to keep that. My students will see me, and that's about it. Nice. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. I've seen some of the illustrations from the forthcoming uh, re-release of that book, and they look incredible. So I, I know people are going to love it. Thank you. I just got to actually get it to them. Right. <laughs> and i finish that. All right. Cool. Uh, and I'll put links to your websites, which are austincopic.com and spherensundry.com in the description. Thank you. Cool. As for myself, I have got a big month on the podcast lined up. I've got an episode I'm working on on the astrology of comedians, which is going to be amazing. Another episode on Egyptian astrology, another episode on sinistry and relationship compatibility. I'm also going to release the Aquarius episode that I already recorded with Bear and Aaron River, uh, Aaron Fogel <laughs> and, and Bear River. Uh, it's been a long episode, a long week. Uh, due to all of that, but that that episode's already available for early access through my page on Patreon, and then I'm going to record the Pisces episode soon in order to finish this year-long Zodiac series that I've been doing, and I'm really happy to finally bring that to completion. Um, so if people want to get early access to any of those episodes or just help support the production of the podcast in general, please join my page on patreon.com, and you can also join us in the live chat like some of these people have joined us today, we've got a bunch of amazing patrons that have been joining us and typing comments and following along with this live recording today, which has just been amazing. Uh, finally, I have an event coming up where Jen Zart of the Cayley Institute Library is hosting me for a talk about my new book, which is the translation of Vadius Valens Anthology, which came out a few months ago. On February 8th, we're going to do a free one-hour discussion to celebrate what Jen calculated as the 1,903rd birthday of Vadius Valens, who was born on February 8th, 120 CE. 
and we're going to talk about his work, his contributions to astrology, and about this new translation that was recently published um, by me of Mark Riley's translation. So I'll put a link to that, but you can find out more information about it at kaylee.institute, and we'll be doing that for about an hour, do basically a Q&A on that book on February 8th. So I'm looking forward to that. All right. I think that's it for this episode of the podcast. Thanks everyone for watching or listening, and we will see you again next time. Bye. Bye. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean-Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, synastry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. I also recently published a new translation of the anthology of the 2nd century astrologer Vedius Valens, which is one of the most important sources for understanding the practice of ancient astrology. You can find that by searching for Vadius Valens the Anthology on Amazon or other online book retailers. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course, you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. I also recently launched a new course there called the Birth Time Rectification Course, where I teach students how to figure out your birth time using astrology when the birth time is either unknown or uncertain. You can find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Each year, the podcast releases a set of astrology calendar posters for the coming year, and we've just released our 2023 Planetary Alignments and Planetary Movements posters, which are now available on our website at theastrologypodcast.com slash store. There you can also pick up our 2023 Electional Astrology Report, where Lisa Scheim and I went through the next 12 months and we picked out the single most auspicious date for each month using the principles of electional astrology. You can get that at theastrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Finally, thanks also to the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is happening May 25th through the 29th, 2023, just outside of Seattle. This year's conference is going to be a hybrid conference where you can either attend online or in person. 
Find out more information at norwac.net.